presentation on the fire but it's just a presentation so we don't really get to speak on it and I want to uh, talk about the evacuation situation and uh, who's coordinating it because it's the sheriff's responsibility the sheriff's one that does the evacuations not Cal Fire not Forest Service it's the sheriff so apparently we don't have a sheriff now so uh, the evacuation to um, Douglas City the evacuation of Poker Bar um, I, have, I have fire experience. My husband has a lot of fire experience. I'm not saying that uh, you know you shouldn't have people evacuate when you need them to, but this was it was ludicrous, and it scared a lot of people needlessly. And, and now we have it's backed to where it would be more reasonable. But at this point, I would really like the town of Lewiston the mandatory evacuation lifted. It's been more than a week. Uh, if you wanted to continue, if you guys could talk to someone, you want to continue it on the east side of Trade Dam Boulevard, that's understandable. But the town of Lewiston, it's been more than a week. And uh, I'm trying to figure out how to get my husband's medication to him, and he's not going to leave, and I don't blame him. Um, so there's no reason to continue this. And I don't know the mix up of this, but the information that's been given out. Uh, by the fire authorities has been a pittance. I've, fu I've watched fires, I pay attention to them, I go to the websites, I look at the maps. There's never been a map on the Cal Fire site where it's supposed to be. And then they tell us not to panic and not to go on social media. Well, that's all we have. We have social media and people that can see it. And so um, this is ludicrous and it's unnecessary. And it would be great if we could lift the uh, mandatory evacuation on the town of Lewiston. Thank you. Diane Richards, Hay Fork, I second um, K. There are a lot of people that need to get back in there, whether for their animals or resupply, et cetera. You should lift it at this time or even a, a uh, a few hours a day or something of that nature so that people can get in and out. Um, almost eight years ago when Sheriff Haney uh, was in his first seated, he came before the board and this room was absolutely filled with people, standing room only. I was part of his safety team at that time and we had said we want to take uh, this, this bull by the horns. We want to do something about the fuel loads the roads being closed, we need to maintain our roads, we need to do preventative uh, measures so that we don't burn up in catastrophic fire. And this is what is a catastrophic fire. This is now we've seen one, um, the Redding, this car fire. And this can happen to us where you, there's nothing that can stop it. We need to get the fuel loads out of the forest. Uh, when he presented that and his whole team, we had uh, foresters, all kinds of experts ready to go take this on here in the Shasta Trinity. Um, it was denied by the board. He was sent, you know, hey, go off. In fact, uh, Supervisor Moore said to him, come back when there is a fire. You said that, Judy. Yes, you did. 
I was there. And, and so this is, what, this is what we've inherited. Eight years, we could have been working on this eight years ago, and we are not. Um, I proposed a shaded fuel break during the collaborative. That's our number one project. Uh, it was proposed to be a thousand miles of road. Now it's down to just a pilot project of a hundred miles, and still not one stick has left the force. When are you going to use your authority and do something about it, please, before we all burn to the ground like Reading? Thank you. Any other public comment? All right, with that, we we'll close public comment. We're going to receive a presentation uh, regarding the car fire. I don't know who wants to lead off, but go ahead. Hi, my name is uh, Scott Kenny. I'm a public information officer with uh, Cal Fire, um, assigned to the incident management team. Uh, it's assigned to this incident of car fire. So what I'm going to give you today is just a briefing on the operations yesterday uh, for the fire, uh, the operations that we anticipate for today, as well as some of the weather that may impact this fire. So currently, as of yesterday, uh, we are seeing additional containment line uh, essentially being constructed and repopulation efforts down in this area. This is where the, the harder push was made early on in that fire when we had some of those driving winds. And then as the fire has transitioned, this is kind of where in the direction in which the fire was progressing in the past several days. So currently right now, and I'm trying to kind of stay out of everybody's way to see this map, what we're looking at right now is uh, there's a lot of increased fire activity up in the north part of this fire. That's where we're seeing it kind of move. Uh, it's aligning with the topography, and uh, you are going to see some uh, runs up in this area. Fire activity is relatively latent at this point in time. Uh, backing fires is kind of what we're expecting along a lot of on a lot of this fire. So, which is good, but when you have that, sometimes there's rollout and it can make runs back up topography. So there is potential for that. When it does that, there is potential for spotting. So uh, the fire activity is still very real and the behavior is still threatening in some areas. Our Achilles heel yesterday was essentially down here, uh, meaning that we just need to kind of try and, uh, and get a handle on the southern section. Uh, what we've been seeing recently on the weather past several days was this high level northwest wind coming in late night, early morning. And then the afternoon transitioning to a south southeast uh, coming up. So depending upon when those winds are hitting, um, it's either beneficial or not beneficial for this bottom area down here. But there is line construction. As of yesterday, they did have three spot fires uh, ranging in a quarter acre, acre, and 25 acres. They were able to get a handle on those and wrap uh, hose and, and equipment around that. But like it just proves that spotting is still a potential and this fire activity is still present. So uh, something that we still need to be hyper vigilant about. The area up here, we're still seeing some backing uh, fire activity, meaning that's kind of going down slope. It's not necessarily making the runs. Still a lot of work to be done, but there's still a lot of work that has been done. Uh, they're still trying to connect lines in there, whether it's hiking trails, UHD trails, whatever they can, favorable topography, so they can get uh, up as close to this fire line as they possibly can. Um, same thing in all uh, these areas, there is uh, dozer lines being constructed. There is a large dozer line that is up on the top part of this ridge, but we're still trying to get more direct on this fire and, uh, and not try and allow this fire to burn up any more real estate. So we're trying to get those lines as close to this fire as we possibly can, but this is some of the most active fire behavior that we are seeing. Uh, part of the Pepoose drainage, that was a fire, a backfire yesterday. Um, it was looking good. There was a, a few rollout. They were able to catch that. They're hoping to hold that section. Lewiston area yesterday, obviously this morning at 7 a.m., we're seeing some more containment line on this side, which is great. But because of the fuel type, the heavy timber, it is a lot harder to essentially put that heat out in that area to actually deem that safe. There is. Still, basically, when we put containment line in there, we're kind of, we're basically kind of saying that we're confident that um, under the current weather conditions, there's a good chance it's not going to cross that line. Uh, there's still obviously behavioral, weather behavior, it's a lot of stuff that could wind check those lines. Um, so there's that potential. So we just need to go in, and essentially, we're we've got a lot of crews in there, and they're kind of essentially what we call mopping up and uh, trying to make sure that we take out all the heat in that area about two, three hundred feet in. So that's kind of the goal of this area. The Grass Valley area, um, 
the fire is kind of uh, burning towards the, the line, uh, Grass Valley, some hand line down to County Line Road, and then some other lines that we've created via dozer and uh, connecting some roads down in that area. Uh, in there, whether the fire is going to hit, it's, it's called indirect fire attack. So it means that you're not going right along the fire's edge. We're out ahead of it. And with that, there's only two ways to fight that. That's either you bring fire along that road and you control when the fire hits it, or you let the fire hit that road itself. So uh, you may see that in different tactics in that area. And uh, utilizing that, if we did do a backfiring operation, the key point to that is patience. Because the way these winds, the way the weather, and the way this fire has been behaving, uh, we have to we have to wait for that right time to end it, essentially do that and, and control that fire when it hits that line when we want it to hit that line. So, um, like I said, that's that's kind of the, the tactic that we're going to see here. Weather wise, what we're looking at, it's not really changing that much. Uh, three words to describe it: it's going to be hot, dry, um, and a little bit more stable. But it's it's definitely still going to be hot and dry. We're going to see increase of temperatures from yesterday about three per, uh, three degrees. Uh, we're back down to potential uh, single-digit RHs. The nice thing is, is there is a high above us, um, meaning that there is a little bit more stable atmosphere, which is what you guys have seen is a lot more smoke, obviously. That's that cap, so there's a cap on this fire. What that does for us is, is the smoke doesn't allow the sun to penetrate through. It's kind of like a cloud. It doesn't preheat those fuels, so vegetation, that sort of thing, gets it to its ignition temperature as well as um, allowing uh, some air, clear air to get in there so this fire can kind of uh, behave a little bit more erratic. So with that, if we get that cap on there, there's a, there's a good two-day window um, that we've got right now to kind of attack this fire aggressively, and that's what we're going to attempt to do. Um, so we're going to try and achieve that, but like I said, it, it, it's still hot and dry. What we are noticing on a change is that northwest, what I was talking about, that northwest wind coming in at night, early morning, and a south-southeast wind coming in in the afternoons and then changing back to a north-northwest wind, that southeast wind is kind of going away, so to speak. So it's kind of going to be this lull of no winds during the day. Um, you are going to see your, your local topography kind of do at head level um, weather, meaning that you guys are going to see down canyon winds. So and obviously you guys can follow your topography on your rivers and lakes. Anything that's down canyon, you're going to see that during the night. Um, and then you're, and during the day, you're going to see some uncanny uh, wind. So up here, you're going to see it push like this. And then same thing in here. So the ridge tops are really hard to fight just because you have competing and battling winds. These are all things that we are uh, putting into account on our firefighting operations and our tactics. Uh, they're constantly taking weather, getting that back to our uh, operations so that way they can dictate their efforts and, and better attempt this fire. It's so. so kind of what we're looking at for today. Uh, and the weather that we're looking at for the next couple of days. Any questions on operations or weather? Good morning. My name is Joe Smales. I was uh, just here about three or four weeks ago. Uh, I'm the district ranger uh, for the last five months here, a permanent district ranger here in Weaverville. And uh, I will give a little bit of a report. We are still in unified command on the car fire. Scott Russell is the agency administrator and Leslie Inn is our agency rep. Uh, my role here is to supply information uh, to those uh, decision makers. And uh, half the time I'm down there and half the time I'm up here. I'd like to report also that uh, uh, the number of acres uh, burned on forest service is 6,466. That was as of last night. Uh, of that, 4,583 is in our DPA, uh, Direct Protection Area. I'd uh, like to say also that uh, we do have, we are at drawdown um, on the Trinity River Management Unit. That means we have one engine in Coffee Creek, we have one engine in Big Bar, but we also have three contract engines from Firestorm. And so, uh, as illustrated last, late last week, we did have a little start um, in Canyon Creek. It was called the Conrad incident. Uh, we caught that at an acre and three quarters. So we don't want to have uh, something get away from us in addition to what we have on the car. Um, I should also mention that any aircraft 
uh, that we have uh, for new starts, that would be the priority for aircraft response. Um, additionally, uh, we are starting to talk about suppression repair. Um, there are areas that we are looking at. Of course, it has to be safe. Uh, it would be in the black. It would not be any areas that are, that are active, but we are starting to look at a suppression repair plan um, as early as possibly next week um, in those areas that uh, have burned about a week ago or more. Um, I mentioned at the OES meeting last week that we have resource advisors from the Forest Service looking at protecting our resources, water, um, archaeological sites, and, uh, and many other features that we have on the ground. And so that is continuing. Um, I'd like to say also that uh, we will be looking at salvage, timber salvage opportunities as they present themselves, uh, particularly those areas that uh, support uh, significant volume per acre that have been burned. So we will look at those, what our capacity is, and we may bring uh, other other agencies in, uh, other forest in to look at those opportunities and see where that where that hits. Um, that's about what I have. Are there any questions for me? Uh, yes. So are, are you working with BLM on? Are you guys going to work with BLM on the salvage side, or you just work on your lands and BLM will work on theirs? That's a good question, uh, Keith. We would look at. We would. Uh, it would it would very well could be a joint effort because uh, there's there's far more BLM land that's been affected in this fire, so we would look at that. And so for the economy of scale, uh, that very well may present itself. Uh, we'll have to see. Uh, the the big question is uh, once our GIS people come on, what are those opportunities? And it may be uh, you know maybe the dividing line between Forest Service and BLM. Um, there isn't much difference. Uh, the fire doesn't care what property it burns. Uh, so, yes, we may look at that very well. It's a good question. Thank you. And then there's one other issue on, on the um, on the French Gulf side. During the Bush administration, they did some healthy forest work, um, and so they left large trees, did all the undercover. Uh, hopefully, you guys have some sort of research teams that go in and look at the difference between the clear cuts, the, the healthy forest, and then the non-managed forest, or take a little cheap shot at it, but the non-managed forest, right. Um, and right. see what the fire behavior was in there. That would be a fascinating report to hopefully you guys put a priority on Monitoring. Monitoring those. What happened. So the third right. opportunity to see that. Right. I, I will make a note of that, um, that particular mention that you made. Thank you very much. Um, is there a kid that's name here? Yes. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, uh, Board. My name is Mike Hardy. I'm a liaison officer on Incident Management Team 1, who is currently managing uh, the CAR fire. My assignment is to uh, uh, be embedded in the Trinity County EOC as a liaison from the incident uh, to the county on updates with the fire and to uh, keep your county officials uh, abreast. Um, I can tell you um, that uh, this has been a challenging fire, as you well know. Um, and since it burned into uh, Trinity County and, and Trinity has opened up the ELC, um, uh, my job is to help uh, navigate the, the Trinity side with uh, the goings on with the fire and, uh, and the county aspects, uh, governmentally speaking. If you've attended a couple of the uh, community meetings on the Trinity County side, I can tell you that um, there are a couple things. One, a priority of this incident, and always will be, is the safety of firefighter personnel and civilians. Uh, that is by far the number one priority. Secondarily to that is to try to mitigate the fire and to get some type of norm normalcy back to the community. Uh, in a nutshell, that's, that's what we try to do. Uh, and we are certainly sympathetic uh, and empathetic of the impacts of any community. Um, this fire, as you know, uh, has taken seven lives. Uh, two uh, uh, firefighters, uh, PGA and E-worker, and uh, 
four other uh, uh, civilian lives. So we take that safety aspect very seriously. Um, obviously, there uh, are concerns and some um, maybe some um, misconceptions about repopulation uh, when we evac uh, an area. Yes, it, uh, evacuation is uh, under uh, the law enforcement side of it when evacuations happen. And uh, evacuations take place under uh, circumstances where fire is impinging on communities. Um, we take an effect the size of the fire, how fast it's moving, the fuel conditions, the weather behavior, and in this case, uh, fire behavior previously on the, in, on, on the same incident uh, that acted like no other fire that we've ever seen before. So, uh, are, were we concerned uh, when we evacuated the communities of Lewiston, Douglas City, uh, those areas? Yes, we were, because we had already killed a few people on this fire. So, once it's evacuated, uh, yeah, people are out of that area until we can get in and deem that area safe. Safe is putting dozer line in, uh, making sure that there's no fuel between the fire and the community that we're looking at repopulating. And as been said already, this fire has been very challenging. That area behind Lewiston is very steep. We've had spot fires come over our primary lines on several occasions. Um, we had trouble tying in a couple of the lines on a couple of occasions, and we had some slop over. We put thousands of gallons of retardant on lines to try to keep it held right there. It slopped over. Um, this, in this county, fire normally burns from, right, west to east. Normally it burns from west to east. But this fire has continuously challenged us on some nights and some days and burned west. This, this, this area east of Lewiston has been the priority of the fire for five straight days. We have had lots and lots of resources in there to reinforce line, to put air, air resources in and to secure this line right here. And it has continuously challenged us. So we are very sympathetic, and we do not want to keep people out of their residence one day longer than is normal. But the worst thing that we could do would be to repopulate an area just to turn around and try to evacuate it again the next day or a day or two later. So while um, we understand and we're very sympathetic, we will repopulate when it is safe. And we are getting close. We are making good, good gains to that area. And every day at 8 o'clock in the morning and 3 o'clock in the afternoon, discussions are taking place on every area of this fire of where we can repopulate. So that's where we're at. On behalf of the incident commander, commander Brett Cabea, I can assure you that the incident is working very hard to ensure some type of normalcy. And while that is going on in several places, this firefight is long. Uh, we still have a long road. This north side and this east side is still going to be very challenging. The south side is going to be very challenging. So we're, we're in the middle of uh, repopulation. Uh, rehabilitation in some areas, uh, we still have a long firefight on this entire fire. Thank you. Thanks. Sir. Thank you for being here. I know this has been a little bit of a challenge from our viewpoint because the IC has been in Reading for Anderson. And so thank you for coming up here and keeping us informed. Um, just go through me the evacuation process. Cal Fire, in your meeting at the IC, you set the areas and then inform the Sheriff's Department they need to do their work? Or is it totally up to the Sheriff's Department to decide? So on, on the initial attack, when this fire first broke out and it's moving out, it, it has not gone to an extended attack. The incident hasn't uh, switched over to a incident management team. Your local law enforcement, and maybe Chris, the owner sheriff can, can speak on this. It, it, it is a very dynamic situation. So law enforcement is trying to get out in front of where they think the fire is going and just on the fly evacuating people. Evacuation centers haven't even 
really been established. We're trying to get that set up. But people just need to get out. And that's what happened on when this fire first started uh, here uh, on 299. And then the next couple of days, it started to progress. And, in, and, and when it burned into, on this side, into Reading uh, on two nights, uh, with fire behavior that we have never seen. We had fire tornadoes, and you probably saw it on the, on, on the news. That, again, was somewhat on the fly just to get people out in front of the fire. And it is a law, local law enforcement. But once um, a fire gets beyond local control, it, it, it is going to be an extended type of fire. Uh, incident management team comes in, such as uh, incident, Cal Fire Incident Management Team 1. We assume responsibility for the fire. Evacuation sites are being set up, and as the fire progresses, then yes, we have a team uh, with the local uh, sheriff department or local law enforcement, uh, and our folks real-time mapping areas of what would be concern of a concern. And as this start fire started to progress to the west and to the north, we started looking at areas, and we try to zone out an area that would could be affected next based on fire behavior, based on fuel, based on weather. All of those things are taken into account. And then we try to do our best to guesstimate where the next, and typically would be going under an advisory just to let them know that hey, the fire potentially could come this way. And then if it does start to make a move, we go into a mandatory, that zone or that area would be evacuated under a mandatory. And we, we do that throughout the entire fire during the entire time of fire. Does that answer your question? Any other questions for me? Thank you. Um, I would <coughs> like to know if you could address the concerns of there are people that have stayed for livestock, and it is, I think, um, about approximately ninth day. And I'm not asking for people to be returned to clean the refrigerators <coughs> or anything like that. The people that have animals and have chosen to stay there that may or may not need personal medication, is there a way you could schedule um, uh, an entrance and an exit so so people <coughs> can restock their pet food and get medication to their caregivers? I'm not sure. <clears throat> I hate to uh, speak on behalf of the incident. I would have to look into that. Um, certainly, I can talk offline or you can get a hold of me through the EOC. Uh, but if I can address that issue of people staying behind, um, that does pro, uh, pose problematic to the incident for this very reason. Uh, two days ago, French Gulch, uh, there were people that were under a mandatory evacuation uh, that decided to stay. Um, and, and I get it. You know, nobody's going to tell me to leave my, this is my house. Um, well, the fire blew up. Uh, it did. Uh, move into the French Gulch area, and um, people needed to get out. Well, we had two uh, CHP officers that went into a very dangerous situation that almost got burnt over because they were trying to rescue civilians that were under a mandatory evacuation. We always <laughs> try to uh, make sure that when we're under a mandatory evacuation, it is just that. It is mandatory for a reason that we encourage people. We can't force them to leave their house by any means. We can if there is a uh, immediate threat to children out of a home, but we can't remove adults from their home. But it, it poses a very difficult situation. We have to send resources in um, and try to focus our attention to civilian uh, rescue rather than trying to fight fire. Houston, I know there's people in there. We were very lucky, and it was only because of a very hard firefight of a lot of people and a lot of resources that, that we were actually being able to stop that fire at east of Houston and not come into the town of Houston. Um, but there were a couple nights where it was touching up. I, mean, we were, I was in close contact with Under Sheriff Compton where we were going to maybe have to send people in there on one final suite to get people out of there. Very challenging when people decide to stay. I'm sure they're up there going, see, nothing happened. The fire didn't burn into Lewiston. We're all good. Why do we have to leave? Well, there were a couple nights where we didn't know. It was only because there was a very hard fought fight from hundreds of men and women up there uh, 
that was able to stop that car from coming to the And that's very much appreciated. I don't want you to think that I don't. Chris, do you want to talk on anything? Oh, I think it, just a little bit on the uh, on the letting people in and out. It, it basically boils down to a liability aspect. So if if I let you back in, or I say, hey, we're gonna we're gonna let you in. You go do your things and you come out, and you get in and you say, um, I'm not going out. I can't make it leave. Um, and then the other problem we run into is if that does happen and something were to uh, blow up and somebody was hurt or injured or, or died, uh, we would get sued because we allowed them to go back in when it wasn't safe. So we look at, we look at those aspects on uh, what's the liability to, to us uh, and is it truly safe to go back in, all knowing that once you touch your piece of private property, I can't make you do anything at that point. So those are things that, that we've looked at on um, how do we make this work? Animal control is working really, really hard to uh, get out to all the animals. If you call her and say, hey, I've got, uh, somebody said ducks, i got ducks. And she went up with the ducks. They're, they're working very, very, very hard to make sure all of the animals and everything are taken care of inside the evacuated centers. Um, and, and the members of the public are right. The, the authority is truly ours to evacuate. Um, and initially, yeah, we make the decision because we're in it right then until uh, IC stands up. And then we rely on the experts, the fire experts, to truly tell us what is needed in certain areas because now our focus has changed on that the immediate evacuations are done and we go more to a, a security patrol, looting patrol, those type of things. And then if a certain area does get threatened by additional fire, uh, they tell us, hey, this area needs to be done and we can go in and get that done as well. And it's, it's a really good relationship we have um, to get that done. So, and it's, and it's proven to work pretty well in the past. Chris, what about, is there any way to get somebody's medicine to them? We can make arrangements. If you call the sheriff's office um, and you say, hey, I need to get our meds out, we tend to, we, we try to minimize uh, what we take out because then we get a bunch of requests. You know, hey, can you take these DVDs, which has happened this far. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yes, anything that, that is uh, like that, those those items of medication and things, we will absolutely make arrangements to get those in. Just got to come ask us and we'll do it. So. Any other questions? No? Thank okay. you. Um, Letty? Good morning. Uh, Letty Carson, Director of uh, HHS and OES. I just wanted to give the board an update on our, our uh, EOC operations. We fully uh, activated level one of our EOC. Our functions that are being supported through this incident is our logistics, planning, operations, finance, and PIO. I really have to say that you know, our partnership with CAL FIRE, the, the Incident Command PIOs have been amazing. Um, it's, it's been a struggle with, of course, everyone's experience of power outages and, and, and such, but the communication has been a priority for our EOC to reach out to the community. I think this is probably the first time we really used Code Red as many times as we did, um, which has been an experience, but we really rely on the communication that we get from uh, agencies like PUD uh, and the Sheriff's Office, but I think we did, a, I really want to applaud our staff. Uh, we have some uh, representatives from various departments in the county uh, filling our EOC positions. We have Behavioral Health, the Road Department, and HHS. I've been fortunate enough to attend an IC command meeting uh, with Rick Tippett uh, er earlier last week, and I really want to really copy what uh, Chris was saying. There really are experts that are really advising us as far as what their recommendations are on these evacuations and, and keeping the evacuations. I, I witnessed Rick talking with the CHP uh, sergeant to reevaluate the poker bar. And sure enough, they were able to 
evaluate that, that it was okay to reopen that poker bar. But I really want to really give the praise of the experience and the knowledge that they have is amazing. And we really need to trust and respect that. And I, I just hope we can get to that point. Because I, and I do understand the inconvenience as well. We are working with the Red Cross shelter um, in meeting the health needs of those who are evacuated. Um, we are working on moving the shelter to the uh, First Baptist Church that will be happening this week. We're, we're finalizing the date and the logistics for that. Um, we have implemented disaster service workers from county personnel to assist with that. So I appreciate uh, the support of HR and our, our CAO. I really want to give kudos to our doctor and CAO Coons. He's been a, a true a supporter at the AOC uh, during the times of our power outage. There were there were evenings we were there to almost midnight trying to get to the information out to the public. Uh, so thank you, Dr. Coons. So overall, I just wanted to just give you an update that I'm very proud of our EOC team and the support that we've been given and the communication that we've been having from all of our partners. And uh, we will keep you apprised of any updates and changes. Okay. Any questions? <coughs> Okay, thanks. Thank you for everyone's Caltrans. Good morning. I'm Clint Birkenpass. I'm with uh, Caltrans. I'm a project manager. I'm also the project manager. It's really a hot mic. Yes. I'm also the project manager on the emergency repairs that we're doing for the car mm -hmm. fire. Um, uh, probably the biggest question is when are we going to have 299 open? Um, the answer to that is we're still under unified command. Uh, we still um, report to the incident management team. Uh, the decisions are being made. Um, what areas to be repopulated, what's safe to go into. Um, when, when those meetings occur at 8 o'clock and 3 o'clock, you know, we're there. We're part of those meetings as they're repopulating areas, as they're opening new, new areas um, back up. And uh, we are working diligently to stay ahead of those areas as we're, we're moving uh, down Highway 299, uh, right now focused on the east side of the closure from Buena Ventura into old, the town of Old Shasta. Um, focusing a lot of efforts there. We want to be ahead of that and ready when those areas are deemed safe and, and we want to repopulate those areas. We want to be ready um, uh, to, at a minimum, allow one-way traffic control into those areas. Um, as we open additional areas and then move our way through um, Highway 299 of Caltrans, uh, uh, we have a contractor out there who's running three, three crews uh, to try to remove our hazard trees and restore our safety devices, including guardrails and signs and regulatory signs, those sorts of things, so we can open that up to traffic as quickly as, as possible. So we're doing everything we can to stay ahead of the, the openings and um, as those areas are deemed safe to be open, we will open those to some sort of um, traffic control um, access through, through those areas. Thanks, Clint, for giving us the latest update. Yeah, here The update. I know Dave was uh, gave the community an update on Friday. Um, it's my understanding that you do have crews currently, even under this joint command, working to get guardrails up, bring some trees down, so you can take advantage of this bit of a closed section to keep moving, so you can open that road. Is that correct? That is correct. Our, we we did hire a contractor under emergency contract. He has three crews currently running. Um, uh, I believe from 6 in the morning to 6 or 9 o'clock at night, they're running uh, uh, very quickly to, to drop the um, hazard trees that are, are just in imminent uh, danger to the roadway and to the traveling public, and then also to replace um, the guard rail that's, that's burned up and just laying on the ground. Uh, second question, do you have any sense of when you might start piloting cars through? Again, we're under the unified uh, uh, command, and, and when that's deemed, safe by um, uh, by the incident management team uh, we'll start letting people through Thank you. Mm -hmm. so as soon as you're lifted from the unified you'll be able to pilot that's our current plan yeah we're, uh, we're working just as fast as we can to at least one lane through uh, 299 um, as 
as it begins to improve and we get more and more work accomplished, you know, that'll certainly get less and less restrictive as, as we go. Okay. I just want to say thank you for um, interrupting your work on 36 because we have a lot of people coming that way and uh, a big kudos I know that um, you talked to Rip Tippett and you put a sign out there on 36 uh, cutting across to Wildwood. We had logging trucks and huge uh, situations and so I, it was a weekend and you got that signage out there and I appreciate it very much. Great. Thank you. Okay. I see CHPs in the back. Do you have anything you want to add in? Good morning. Uh, oh. <laughs> uh, I'm Sergeant Adam Battle. I'm the uh, first, uh, well, this is senior supervisor here at the Trinity River CHP office. Uh, Ryan Ham asked me to come speak on his behalf. He's actually down at the, at the command post. He's been down at the command post ever since they established a command post. Uh, Sometimes he's able to put Angle to work during the day. He was a graveyard guy for um, a while, but now he's down there during the day. Um, so he just wanted me to talk to you a little bit about what the Highway Patrol did in response to this. Um, I think it was the second day after the fire began to start coming in a Reading. Uh, Northern Division, which is out of Reading, the division chief declared a tactical alert. He put 11 CHP areas on tactical alert, which obviously what we do with that is they cancel your days off and we go to two 12-hour shifts a day and they ordered multiple personnel from all over northern division to respond to the reading area as well as up here to help with traffic control and evacuations for the sheriff's departments we also had people up here from i think i talked to a guy that was from bakersfield uh, golden gate division we have a special response teams uh, valley division which is out of the sacramento area so we had resources, hundreds of CHP officers up here from all over the state. And uh, they did a really good job helping out everything down there and helping out the evacuations. So when things like this happen, the CHP is more of a support role. Um, we end up, to be brutally frank with you, we end up being the bad guys because we're the ones standing at the road closure telling everybody they can't go home. When we're just abiding by what the Sheriff's Department has requested us to do and the Unified Command. So that's what our role is. We, they say, please keep people out. That's what we do. But then we get all up. And John, and I understand. I, I personally know how they feel. Uh, I'm one of the only, I live in Reading. I live in West Reading off Victoria. I got evacuated Thursday morning a week and a half ago. My family's still not home. My house is there. I'm very, very fortunate for on a personal note. But I personally, I didn't leave. I fought fire by myself. For my neighborhood for a couple of days so that's why my house is there so that's when got firemen you know but i had the luxury of, of and, and i will say i do have the luxury of being able to check on my home because obviously i'm in a patrol car and i can come in and out of the evacuation zone so uh so that's what we're doing we're going to continue to do what we're doing we have four road closures you may or may not be aware where they are one's at uh, poker bar 299 i got an officer sitting on trinity dam boulevard right at the dam where the little lookout is I got an officer on Rush Creek at China Gulch. Originally it was on SR3 at, China, at uh, Rush Creek, but then people would take China Gulch and go right behind them and go back into Lewiston. That's what they were doing. Uh, and then we, at the request of Chris, just uh, I think about a week ago, we put someone up on Browns Mountain Road because people were going up Little Browns and taking Browns Mountain and going to Lewiston. So I got an officer sitting up there. He says it's the best spot. No one's ever coming up there. Now they know there's a CHP officer up there. They're not going up there, but we're keeping people out. Uh, I also have, normally I've had two additional officers per day roving, but they're also responsible for calls throughout the county. So they cruise around Lewiston, but if we get a call in Hayfork or out west, then they're, they gotta go handle that too. Um, so basically we run in six guys and one woman at night per ship, so 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. And uh, two supervisors. And we also have a supervisor that works here that's actually on the incident management team as well, Sergeant Duggar. So that's what we do. You guys have any questions? Oh, thank well, thank you. thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Did I miss anybody? Charlie, do you have anything to say? Okay. All right. Thank all of the responders and everybody involved in this. And
and of course the people on the list and that are out um, putting up with all this. So with that, we'll take a, just a quick five minute break so you guys can get back to work and
office we have going. Okay, we'll come back into, into order. Uh, we'll move on to the consent calendar. These items include routine, non-controversial matters and will be acted upon by the board by one roll call motion. A member of the board, staff, or public may request an item be pulled and considered separately. Supervisor Chadwick, do you have anything today? No, sir. Supervisor Morris. To reports, we have a 10 o'clock hearing. We'll do reports until 10 o'clock. Uh, any reports from department heads? Sean Nelson, HR Director. Um, I just wanted to remind everybody, uh, Veteran Service Officer Patrick Meeker is working very hard to be available. We do not have any statistics there are any local veterans that have been affected or impacted by this that he is making himself available for any needs of any local veterans um, and then I just wanted to recognize in the risk management department we had our annual loss prevention uh, audit and we received our results back yesterday and we scored 97 out of 100 which is one of the top scores we've ever earned uh, Rebecca Cooper is not here today, but I wanted to recognize her very hard, um, dedicated work this year on supporting every department, and I wanted to support and recognize every department for the efforts that they are making to uh, maintain a really strong loss prevention and safety program. Um, in addition to the funding we receive by passing that annually, there are some additional funds, um, $2,500 to go toward additional safety training and support. And because we scored between 95 and 100, we're going to receive an extra 1,000 toward safety trainings and support. So I thought that was fantastic. And then um, the HR group, amidst all of these uh, power outages and um, internet and everything coming and going, they are working tirelessly to keep HR payroll or recruitments uninterrupted, um, payroll actions and personal actions on top of things. So I just wanted to recognize our groups as Great. long as we are. Thank you. mitigation grant from FEMA uh, for assistance to homeowners. Um, what this is, this isn't a, a grant necessarily uh, to the county. It's a grant that the county uh, pursued to provide assistance to homeowners that might be interested in elevating their houses out of the floodplain. Um, 
So particularly uh, for folks over in the Lena area whose house burned and the foundation of the house is like two feet down below the floodplain, you can actually get FEMA assistance to raise it above the floodplain and FEMA will pick up 75% of the cost. It's just that we have to identify uh, the desire and the need uh, before we actually submit all of the grant to get it. So today there's an informational meeting about that and then discuss uh, uh, what we need from people uh, prior to sign up next week. Um, we have to have the grant completed and to feds by the uh, beginning of next month. Uh, so the meeting is tonight at Junction City Elementary School at uh, 430 Red Hill Road and begins at 7 p.m. So I just wanted to let everybody know that that was going on. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Go ahead. How's that? Um, quick clarification on that meeting, Rick. Um, of course, there are some homeowners that were burned out that can't rebuild because of this issue, but this may help them raise their new house. So is it just um, apply to those who are along the Trinity River? It, because other people got notices, and uh, I'm sure Supervisor Mines received some phone calls. If, if the house, the difference between, if you're in the floodplain, and you build an <coughs> elevation, your insurance is, I, I, I can't e exactly quote what it is, but just for example purposes, it's usually about $1,000 for every $100,000. Uh, does, does it just apply to those on you, Trinity River? It, That's my first question. Yes. Okay. And if you raise the house two feet above the floodplain, which our people are out of the floodplain, but this opportunity applies to them. If they raise it up to two feet above the floodplain, your insurance goes down like a hundred dollars a year for every hundred thousand. So it's it's a substantial savings in flood insurance, um, and it it goes to everybody that's within two feet of the hundred year floodplain um, along the river. Okay, because those folks who received the letter that aren't on the river, so there was some we, confusion. Yeah, we we. Tried to identify just the houses that were appeared to be close, um, and but you know there might have been some. It, it's hard when you're doing a, a mail merge and sure. GPS and sure, sure. all that yeah. stuff. So okay, well, I just need that clarification because I was getting some questions and they were confused. Yeah, and this I want to make sure I express very clearly that this opportunity also goes to existing homeowners whose houses are too low and are affected by the floodplain along the river, they have an opportunity to elevate their house okay. um, in this program. So it, it applies both to people that are rebuilding and to existing uh, homes that are out there along the river. Okay, because there are folks that uh, weren't on the river that got your letter, so that's why okay. I was confused. Thank you. My apologies. So only from below the dam? Uh, no. In this program, you have to take sections. Uh, you have to identify uh, geographical areas. And being that the Lena fire had happened recently, we chose to uh, do the Junction City uh, area. Um, these grants come out every time we have a natural disaster. Um, this, these grants were actually uh, back to, uh, initially we applied under the storm uh, grants, but these are the grants from the fires of last uh, September, October, um, in Santa Rosa in that area. And again, there'll be, since there was a disaster in Shasta, there'll be another set of hazard mitigation uh, grants that will come out in about nine months to a year. And depending on how this works, we might look at uh, continuing up the river as we, as we go so that we can bring in other areas and uh, eventually get all the way to the dam. There's still a train river above the dam, by the way. And then there's Hay Fork Creek. I mean, there's anywhere where we have houses in the floodplain, we're going to try to post this on and okay. get this program. And uh, one of the reasons we do it is we also have the community rating system. You might recall from other discussions, which is uh, uh, how well we try to make our community floodproof. Uh, if we make a lot of effort into making it floodproof, we get better community ratings. 
which means everybody in the community gets cheaper insurance. Any other report? No. Oh, okay. Thank you. All right. Any other department heads? Yeah, I guess since we didn't have any consent items full yet. Um, we got nothing but time. Sounds That's right. <laughs> I'll uh, give my department report, though, in the context of what's been happening in the last week. Tim Rogers with probation. So, um, over the course of this incident, we've had uh, eight officers and two juvenile correctional officers that uh, have responded. Um, our staff have assisted with, assisted with uh, both evacuations and community patrols um, since the incident. Um, we also um, pulled all the information on the supervised individuals on the community uh, in the community and, and looked at types of offenses and saturated the community targeting individuals with theft histories, um, individuals that we dealt with the at high risk for looting. Uh, we uh, paid special visits to those individuals and then kept a very close eye on them. Uh, we also had two of our own staff that uh, were evacuated as well. Uh, so we were impacted both uh, professionally and personally. Uh, the probation department also assisted with housing lien officers or law enforcement mutual aid that came from other counties to assist with the incident. Uh, we even had two of our officers that came back from out of state, one of them canceled a vacation um, in uh, Georgia to come back for the incident. Um, and as far as impact to the court system, we had two uh, court days that were rescheduled to alternate days, mostly because of the power outages, um, but that definitely had an impact on the court system as well. And we are at this point uh, getting back to normal operations, thankfully. Thank you. Thank your uh, guys for coming back and helping out. If, if we did not go to the level of what the sheriff's department did with canceling all vacations, this was voluntary by staff. So yeah, I, I definitely have a, an awesome staff for sure. Okay. Any other department heads? <clears throat> with that, we're going to move up to the. Uh, 10 a.m. public hearing. Uh, this is Leslie handling all this. This is uh, planning and zoning. Conduct a public hearing to uphold, modify, or overturn planning commission's action to deny a variance requiring a 350-foot commercial cannabis cultivation setback to a neighboring residential dwelling. Good morning, Leslie Hubbard, Deputy Director of Planning. Um, I would like to direct you to the staff report from the Planning Commission meeting when this item was heard on June 28th. Um, in the staff report that we have for you here today, there's a clerical error in the distances that are reported between the cultivation site and neighboring residences. The distances that are in the staff report for the Planning Commission are correct. So that has been an ongoing issue with a lot of numbers between APM numbers and distances between structures and cultivation sites. So rather than get um, hung up on numbers, let's go to the staff report and I can show you the maps, the figures, so it should be a little clearer. So if you have the staff report in front of you and you go to figures, do you have yeah. Okay, so figure three shows you where the cultivation site is in relation to the neighbor who is affected by the cultivation site. There is one neighbor that has a permitted dwelling within 350 feet of the cultivation site. Okay, so we are looking at a cultivation site that is on Bear Rock Road in the Trinity Pine subdivision. The Planning Commission heard this item on June 28th, and there were four commissioners present that evening. They voted three against, one in favor of the, approving the variance. Yeah. Approving or disapproving? The motion was to, it was kind of a backwards motion. It was. Three were against it, 
one was for it. So a motion was made to approve the variance. And the motion was the actually made for There were two competing motions. Okay. There was a motion made to deny the variance. There was and one the commission. Correct. Okay. So there was one uh, one vote in favor of denying. I'm sorry, one vote in favor of. The motion was to deny. There was one vote in favor. Of, I'm sorry, I'm backwards. There was one vote in favor of. So let's take if there was. So there was a, a motion made to approve the variance and a subsequent to disapprove? Correct. Uh, and the subsequent would have been heard first. And the subsequent did pass with the, to disapprove or not approve the variance was approved, passed three to one. Meaning that the variance would not have been approved. Correct. Okay, thank you. Um, there was some, yeah, no way. <laughs> uh, there's been some uh, confusion as well about the status of this site. The applicants uh, came into the cultivation program in 2017. Their application was in process. They were not ever given a license in 2017, but they were in process and um, they worked with us very well. And then in 2018, they renewed their license and it wasn't a site visit. Initial site visit was not done until 2018 and it was during the site visit that it was identified that they needed a variance. So they were in process with us for a long time before the need for a variance was identified. We have a number of ways that we determine whether or not a site needs a variance. Primarily, rely, we rely on the applicant identifying that. It's written up in our process to where it's the applicant that's supposed to identify it or their agent, their consultant. Uh, that hasn't, it's worked mostly, in this case, not. Um, and then staff, like I said, did not identify it until we were in the field. So do you have any questions? So the commission denied. Okay. So the there's two on this on the Matthew figure three. There's there's two parcels in two rows shown on this map. Are they under the same license? Uh, he owns you know it's Scott, it's Scott Watkins staff members. Scott Watkins is here. He's the planner that prepared this variant. So if you have specific questions like that, I think Scott would be the best one to field them. Scott? I hear this is a hot mic, so let me, there we go. So yes, there are two parcels affiliated with the single license, and there are grows uh, on both parcels. And so, but the variance is only for the one parcel. The variance is for the license, which encompasses both parcels. Okay. But if there wasn't a grow on that one parcel, then the variance wouldn't be needed? Uh, I would have to check the maps, but I believe the current positioning of both grows on each of the individual parcels that make up the single license would require a variance. And you can see that on figure six, figure five. Figure six is a modified grow outside right. of the variance. Figure six would not have to have a variance. Correct. It would also greatly reduce their cultivation area by, I believe, more than half. Okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Any uh, other questions? I just want to point out that uh, in the program, uh, contiguous parcels are considered one parcel. So even though it's shown as two parcels, it's in the program for the applications considered. Okay, any other questions, technical questions of staff? I have one. Yes. Um, let's see, excuse me, I, I, I think you mentioned this, but I was looking at the map. So they've been paying, but we haven't been able to facilitate an on-site, otherwise this would have been caught prior. In 2017, when they initially came into the program, they did not have a site visit. 
and then they renewed their license as their application was still in process. They renewed again in 2018, and it was in April of 2018 when the first site inspection was had. If I, if I may, sorry, Leslie. If I may, uh, I want to uh, remind the board that on the 1617 and 1718 licenses, they were more of a provisional in nature uh, with the intent of really uh, making sure that we established and got the program moving forward. And so there was a lot of times where we couldn't necessarily make all of the necessary steps and reviews that we could that we do now. But now that we have staff experience and program in place, the, the parameters and views that go into each of these applications is much more in line with the ordinance than what it was back when we were issuing the provisional licenses. And again, the provisional was with the intent of, of um, trying to get the program up and running and uh, then to um, essentially allow people to apply and then verify. And so that's why it, we are going to run in these instances every once in a while. I, I, I'm grateful for that clarification, but I, I did realize that. I just wanted to make sure that while I was looking at the map, I heard what you were saying. And um, is there anywhere on that parcel that would accommodate a future grow without uh, of that same size, that way that they could stay with their full potential, or is there? no place on that secondary parcel. There is no place on the second parcel that would accommodate 10,000 square feet of canopy. They could reduce it, they could reduce their overall 20,000 square feet of designated area to 9,000 square feet, and then it would really be up to them what strategies they use for cultivating to max out their canopy within that designated area. Supervisor remarks. Uh, did any of those points you just raised were brought up at the planning commission? Like, you know, we might be able to consider this if you kind of bring it down a little bit. It was brought up. It was in the staff report that went to the planning commission, and it was one of the things that was discussed. At the and it still wasn't. It still was denied then. Correct. And one of the staff's recommendation when this went to the planning commission was to deny based on precedents that have been set by the Planning Commission where they will consider neighbor's input. If somebody is an impacted neighbor, if they're affected within that 350 foot buffer and they say they are against it, the Planning Commission has given that quite a bit of weight. After the planning, after the planning agendas went online, there were additional comments that were received from neighbors within 350 feet that said, we're good with it. So there was one neighbor that was against it within 350 feet, and there were four that said, we don't have a problem with it. Uh, whose responsibility is it, this is probably for County Council, to make sure that uh, they are in compliance? It certainly is the uh, person or the, the people who wish the, to receive the uh, board or to receive the permit. Margaret, do you want to weigh in on that? It, I guess this is the same as driving down the freeway. If the speed limit is 55, you make sure you go 55. If you go 90, you're going to get a ticket and you take it into your own. It, it's, not, it's not our responsibility to make sure they're within. They need to know the law and comply. And I'm happy, to, I'm happy to quickly respond to that. Uh, so the answer is yes. It's The law is created by the board. Um, the individuals applying are required to know it and self-report on applications, any concerns. Uh, we do do an inspection to verify that it's accurate, uh, which is our site inspection that was discussed. And if we determine that it was inaccurate or if in, improper information was uh, provided, then we, uh, we proceed forward accordingly. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes. A uh, quick question. I'm trying to roll through this. Um, when they put their initial application in, did it not show on their site map, you know, the various parcels and 
distance. I mean, that's where you might get a, an insight as to if they're close or not on that 350. Did that not happen? Uh, they did have structures appearing on their map, but at that time had not um, identified which ones required variances. And this has been part of our um, development process, really, of figuring out how best to identify when a variance is truly needed. Is it a permitted, legally permitted structure? That's a question. And that was not identified at the time that they put their application in. All right, any further questions? With that, we'll open it up to the public for comment. Uh, prior to that, I believe the applicant has an opportunity to uh, present their case. Mm -hmm. All right, so is the applicant here? This is the applicant's agent. Oh, so yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good morning, my name is Michelle Gargano, resident of Hayfork and applicant BMO's current consultant. Today I would like to ask the board to please consider granting BMO's appeal for a variance of a 350 foot setback. As stated in my letter, B has been in the licensing process since April of 2017. While I understand that due to staff limitations, as stated in the report, I do feel that this has not been handled in a timely manner. B has made his payments for both 1718 and 1819 licenses. The Planning Commission di denied this variance based on a neighbor complaint. However, they have granted variances within Hayfork City limits that have also had a complaint in the past. The opposing neighbor is concerned about the visibility of plants from his property. However, all other surrounding neighbors are also cultivating. I'm asking the board to please consider the location, process, and reason for denial. B has worked very hard to remain compliant and hopes to continue down this path. Thank you for your time and consideration. Um, do you have any questions for the applicant? No. Did you? Uh, actually, I, I do. Could you come for the consultant? For the consultant, yes. I'm sorry, your first name again was Michelle. Okay, so Michelle, you are aware of the setbacks that are required, Correct. and yet you moved ahead. Um, at, this application. at the time, um, I was not in charge of creating his site map, so I was overlooked by me as well as a couple of other people, but I feel that it's been a year he's paid both of his fees. Um, I know that they couldn't do all the site visits, but I do feel like it's been a very long time. Is it the site visit person's requirement to let you know, or is it your, requir your requirement to know what is within our ordinance? I'm aware of what's in the ordinance. I just wasn't aware when looking at it. Like I said, it was overlooked by all of us, which is not any one person's fault. Um, but I do not feel that the applicant should be punished for that. And they decided on this variance in April, and now it's August, and there's still been no movement on it. So. Okay. Thank you. Could you? Uh, the variance was denied in April. The variance was brought up originally this April, and then now here we are, still trying to figure it out five months later. So, it's just been a very long process for him, and it's in the middle of the season already. And as stated, he would have to minimize his cultivation almost in half to avoid this, so. Okay, Terry, did you have a question? I did. Um, how far away is he from the neighbor's residence? How I far is this? I believe it's 190 feet. And our, uh, our uh, this is actually a question for you, Leslie. The other gardens in the uh, map, are they all in the licensing process, or are none of them in the licensing process? Some are, some are not. So in the map, as in the aerial photo, or the figures? The figures, these are licensed sites that are in the figures. Right, but when you're looking actually at the map, and you can see all the garden and everything, because you know, the idea is to get everybody into the regulated process. Okay. You know, so I'm just trying to figure out if they're the only one that are doing this, or are they part of a bunch of the farms in the city? Uh, some this? are and some are not. We didn't identify those on here, but just at a glance, um, the best I can tell you so much. The reason I'm asking is specifically she just mentioned that this neighbor's looking at a bunch of other gardens also, and I was wondering are any of those neighbors licensed farms also, or is he just looking at all illegal farms? And so if this is the person that's getting regulated, I think, you know, 
just kind of the perception of is this person actually taking a step forward that we're asking of our people in our county, or is he the you know is he the only one and he's getting ostracized for doing it, or is he part of a group of people that everybody already has been permitted and isn't? And that was just kind of trying to figure out what the lay of what's happening to this gentleman is happening. So, thank you. Thank you. All right. Now we'll open up. Right, right, Margaret. We open up to public at this point. That's correct. Okay. Yes. Yes, please. Diane Richards Hayford. Um, I heard you say that there was variances given to um, other uh, growers. Um, that there was also a complaint. So for you to deny it to one person, but you gave it to the others, um, it would seem like you were not um, giving them equal protection under the law, which I believe is a constitutional protection. So um, if you give it to one, you probably need to give it to all. Thank you. Step up to the mic when you're, when you're ready to come. Uh, morning, Mr. Chair, members of the board, Tom Belanco, Douglas City. Um, I think this presents kind of two questions. Um, one, the variance question, if at all. Two, this season right now, um, the uh, the applicant uh, or uh, who is already renewed obviously indicates you paid substantially into the program. Uh, Granted, I do believe uh, the burden is on the applicant to know when they need a variance, just like if you were building a building that was 100 feet tall and you needed a variance, that's on you to know when you need a variance. Um, and I, I think you asked an excellent question about when this variance came up. I think the Planning Commission ruled on it in maybe June, uh, but whether it came up in April, which is kind of to a cultivator is, is that before you plant or after raises a valid question. No question now that there are plants in the ground that violate this, the variance provision. Uh, I don't know how best to address that without, you know, in, incorporating waste. And in a place like Trinity Pines, where I, I know the variance numbers were calculated specifically with Trinity Pines in mind. Uh, I know a lot of places in the county would probably prefer more than 350 feet set back from a residence, but I think uh, Trinity Pines was specifically considered, so every person's home is their castle, and I, I think uh, you have no choice but to respect that distance. Uh, however, how that applies to this season, uh, that's a more difficult question. I, I don't know if there's an accommodation that can be made to get through this season and then move the, the garden rather than you know, having to move a garden that is probably flowering now. And if you, although that, uh, if, if the variance is due to smell, it's probably about to start. Um, so I, I can see what the Planning Commission was doing with denying the variance, but uh, I do think at least for this season, maybe allowing this season to proceed and then uh, causing the garden to be moved in the off season. Thank you. Sorry, that was earlier. John, yeah, go ahead. Uh, good morning, John Brower from Junction City. And uh, um, I think uh, we should take into account uh, what Mr. Polanco just mentioned. Uh, <clears throat> some means of, of uh, I mean, this is an annual variance that you're considering, and they made them, or you you guys made them annual for this very reason, so that if someone is developing complaints or, or uh, affecting the neighborhood, that uh, that could affect their variance for the following year. But uh, if the neighbor the, uh, in opposition, I mean, is there a history of them calling the sheriff's department and complaining about this operation? Um, is it a neighbor versus neighbor tiff? I don't know, but I do know that it's in everybody's best interest to encourage participation in this. The Pines as a whole has become an environmental and social disaster with uh, 
regards to the criminality and the hiding. And this is a means of bringing it out of the shadows and fixing some of these harms. And uh, I would encourage you to approve this annual variant and see if they can be a good neighbor and get through the season. And if the neighbor continues to complain, then don't approve it next year. But this person's done everything they can to be compliant. And um, if they were an early adopter of the water board, um, they're taking environmental protection seriously, they should be given a shot. Thank you. The gentleman, go ahead. My name is Philip Kearney. I am the neighbor affected. I can agree with the previous two speakers because of the delay in the process uh, that the, the garden is already planted, it's nearing production, uh, so I have no problems with that. Uh, I'll also say that there have been uh, two other neighbors who do have uh, variants. One of them was beyond the uh, 350, this garden is beyond the 350 uh, variance level. Uh, and he is proceeding to build his own house and being in compliance. Uh, the other neighbor is also in compliance. Uh, he he had uh, 10 plants that were within 350 feet. Uh, a variance was granted to him, but he has since told me personally that he has moved those 10 plants out of the variance area. So uh, the way that the variance had to be planned for the further part plot for my house is kind of an, an unusual shape um, and now where the, the, the near view uh, the near to my house is plainly, plainly visible from both my downstairs and my upstairs. The area beyond that, the, the second, uh, I think it's possible 54, is beyond my, uh, my view. So those are things that uh, I think you should take into consideration for this. Thank you. Um, if you have any questions. Yeah. Um, so, because you seem very reasonable here. Very, thank you very much for coming in here and talking to us. Um, sure. uh, if uh, would a good suggestion be that uh, possibly, like you said, this gentleman finishes out this year and then next year makes the adjustment and gets us. That would be agreeable to me. Okay. Um, Mr. Kearney, you aren't taking, you aren't actively going after anybody. As a matter of fact, you're very, you seem to be very friendly with your neighbors and. Are you also going to be serving on the board with the PUD? I am uh, currently installed so, on the PUD. So you are invested in Post Mountain? Yes. And, and the community? I have been there. I have been a Hay Fork resident for over 20 years. I moved to uh, Trinity Pines in 2004 before the Green Rust began. Chair, members of the board, uh, Jake Grossman, Chris Hayfork. Uh, Supervisor Mines used a, a word that I think really encompasses a lot of what's going on up here. He said ostracized. Um, I think it's important, you know, we're seeing.
essentially eliminate a variance that's active puts the cultivator in a position of having to, I could, it could possibly be blackmail. I, mean, I really don't know, but you can begin to think about what could happen if the cultivator is forced to receive the permission of the neighbor every year. I think it's a dangerous situation, and I know that the, the board is very sympathetic to public safety issues. We've already had some public safety ramifications from variances, and I, I wish that you guys um, think about that in the future with your decisions. Anybody else? Okay, we'll come back to the board. Any thoughts, discussions for staff? I think Justin actually just brought up a pretty good point right there. I didn't. I had never. You know, I had never. Well, any more questions, and then we can go to a motion for discussion. Or um, I do have. A, okay, go ahead. I would. I would like to know if the um, permit. I would like to know if the permitted uh, license holder would be willing to answer a question if, if he's present, or if Michelle, if that would fall to you. Um, there was a, a suggestion made by the audience, and then the neighbor. And my question for the um, permitted license holder would be, would he be willing to, if he had the variance this year, then move his garden next year? Um, I think that it can be considered, obviously, but um, like everyone was stating, it would have to be cut in half. You, you're, I'm sorry, the sorry. protocol, you have to come up to, yeah. the, to the mic. Um, Definitely, if that is the only way, then he would do that. Um, I just want to, again, point out that he will have to cut his garden in half in, in next year, you know, if that was tap and if the variance wasn't granted. But yes, if he had to, then he would be willing to do that to get through the year. Any other questions for um, yeah. I have a question for staff. Yeah. Thank you. Go ahead. So, um, we heard from the, uh, the neighbor who seems very flexible. Both parties seem flexible and trying to be good neighbors. Um, was there any discussion? I think I heard from the one neighbor that there were some view issues. Was there any discussion with the applicant that that could get mitigated before it even went to the commission to find some really short-term solutions? Did, did that come up with staff? No, Leslie, it's, oh, oh, sorry. Typically, it's, Scott is dealing with the applicant okay. case. So I, uh, I don't recall if we had that explicit conversation, but that is captured within the staff report, that that is an option to uh, increase the natural screening mm -hmm. between the garden and the impacted neighbor. So I think that's a, a reasonable uh, middle ground. Right, and that wasn't really a consideration at the Planning Commission, is my understanding? It was included in the staff report, but it didn't seem like it had a lot of traction. There were photos that showed what it looked like and said, you know, a possible. Okay. Thank you both. I have a question for Rick. Rick, since the variance process has um, gone to like the second year under a director's permit, is there a motion in this? A scenario where we could grant the rest of the year, which obviously we could do, but then disallow or make it have to go back to the Planning Commission next year, or maybe that's a question for Margaret. Um, the there actually is precedent set where we had one garden that would, was allowed to continue this year under a provisional type situation. Um, because it was in the provisional program, it was allowed to finish out this year, knowing that next year they would have to do uh, something different. And this, I would see as appropriate to fall under the that, and especially since the homeowner has, has acknowledged that and said he'd be okay with it, uh, that would actually have been our, our modification of the recommendation, was to allow for them to go and then 
And then uh, one thing I want to say about variance is, is that the applicant has the right to also apply every year because you know sometimes things change. And so he might be able to work with the owner and reapply under something that's worked out between the two owners for next year. But I would not act on that particular one under a director's use permit. It would be under something the director's use permit is intended after I have a positive vote of the planning commission to approve something that doesn't change. So we could say allow it Now, as is still for the remainder of this year, uh, under provisional licensing. But, and, but looking into next year is my question. So, if, if I may jump in, I, I had a, a good chance, a chance to talk to the director about this. Uh, if it's the board's pleasure, uh, they are annual variances. Uh, so, what I would recommend is if the board's pleasure to allow them to finish out the year, they're probably the best planning or land use um, motion that would be made would be to approve the variance for this year. Um, but not allow it to be subject to the director's use permit, meaning that next year they'll have to come back and have a formal application and can be looked at again. Um, the land use basis for that would be the fact that the, um, the, the original denial was partly based on uh, neighbor complaints, which appear to have been mitigated for the remainder of this year, uh, but not mitigated going forward. So that would probably be the appropriate uh, mechanism to move forward if that's the board's pleasure. That would be my pleasure. Yeah. Is that the form of a motion? Absolutely. Make a motion with uh, what Margaret brought forward, a variance that will continue the rest of this year and not include a director's use permit. And we can take a look at this again next year. Okay. I have a question on that. Um, could not the, for next year, um, options to mitigate at the director's use level be done even not going to the commission if you I, have to agree neighbors? I, I would, the, the director's use permit, the intent of the director's use permit is to approve something that has in a sense been approved before where if the conditions haven't changed, I can approve that again. It's, it's meant to be that, but if it's something that needs to be analyzed again, it's been standard practice to have the variances be heard by the planning commission. And then once, let's say they make those changes and they approve it, then once that's approved by the planning commission, then future actions could be director's use permit. But in, in this particular case, I would recommend that that go back to the uh, planning commission again. Yeah. And my motion doesn't want to take away any future options or rights of my constituent. So, any other thoughts? Okay. All right. I, I will. I just have a thought that next year, unless this is mitigated, I wouldn't vote to continue either. So, I, I just wanted to be clear that that um, to the applicant here that 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 needs to be mitigated next year. Okay. With that we'll go ahead and this is. Do we have to do a roll call on it? Yes, please. Yes, thank you. Supervisor Chadwick? Aye. Supervisor Finley? Aye. Supervisor Morris? Yes. Supervisor Mines? Aye. Supervisor Gross? Aye. All right, our next item up is a um, solid waste under a public hearing here also. Well, we have this is public waste public hearing also. <laughs> okay, three point two, conduct a public hearing, consider adoption of a resolution which confirms the 2018-2019 solid waste parcel fee delinquent list. No fiscal impact to the general fund, $35 per unit to the solid waste enterprise fund. Ms. Reed. Good morning, 
generators that we are sort of solid waste. This is our final public hearing for the 2019 parcel fee season, and it's for adopting the delay with this. Uh, we had two late submittals on protest letters that add to the ones that are already on the agenda. So we have a total of four protests. One is asking for a refund <coughs> of the $35 late fee that was already paid because they, this is the first year that they have been late on their payments. Uh, there is uh, another one that had trouble with online payments and wants us to accept a fake credit, which in essence was denied because it was past the June 30 deadline. And it was due to not being able to make the payment online is what the letter states. And there's one of the ones that we just saw now is a medical disability at payments that uh, were late. Uh, they've sent the payment, so they would like us to accept the late payment and waive the $35 late. <coughs> and there was one protest that actually was against the original resolution in April that is generally protesting the fee the, for the Iowa area. And those are the only ones that I am aware of in the way of protest. Okay. Any questions? I'm a little lost what we do from here. <laughs> okay, so this is your public hearing to see any other protests there, okay. and I need direction on whether to refund the $35, accept the $30 vacant payment, and accept the payment that is laid either at $100 or $135. Okay. Thank you. We'll go ahead and open it up to the public. This is a public hearing. Any comments on the disposal fees? Diane Richards, Hay Fork. Um, $35 on $100 it seems quite um, high for a penalty. Um, I think it should be substantially lower to even that. And if you consider it, it's actually the property owners that are paying for all this. Other people can use the dump and just pay to everybody else. There's no reduction or anything. So we're bearing that cost and then you want to add another a 35% penalty, and I would assume that a lot of people didn't pay because they can't. They're poor people that have had uh, an additional um, assessment on their properties. People have come to me and said, I, I, I came and buy groceries. So I would think they didn't pay it because they really couldn't. So to add on that $35, um, I don't think we should be doing that, actually. Thank you. I, I have a question. Any of the people that came to you or the four that protested? I, I don't know. They just uh, brought up to me about that they can't afford it, and then how. And they also said, you know, how come other people don't have to pay it, just the property owners? And we have some very elderly um, um, property owners that actually, because of the way our um, economy was, where they're four street people, minors, they work for themselves. They don't have, if they have any social security, it's very minimal, and so everything we tack on to them is very difficult for them. Thanks. Thank you. Yes. Good morning. Um, Carol Huang, Trinity County. I'm, uh, well, of course, uh, Weaverville. I originally paid this bill in June. Um, I thought it was paid. Uh, I started experiencing some fraud issues. I had to cancel my checking account. I left enough funds in there to cover any outstanding checks, so I thought it was totally paid until I got the late notice. And then I paid it, including the $35 uh, for each parcel, and then it was returned to me uh, saying I paid it past the deadline. So I really would just like permission to pay the bill. Thank you. I'm just a bad bookkeeper, and I went on vacation, and I thought I was up to date, and I'm not. So I want to know where to spend the money and how much, and I'm hoping I can do that before there's a leave. So. 
if the payment can be accepted today, then we could adjust the list before we submit it for the auditor to put on the tax rolls. Okay. And, um, so does she need to go so over to it. Solid Waste? Mm -hmm. Okay, because I called Solid Waste they told me to come here, but now okay. I'll just go back. Okay. It makes actually, uh, if you want to wait until I'm done, then. Yeah, okay, sure. <laughs> I'm, as you know, Tom Fox. I'm not a property owner in Trinity County, but I am a constitutional counsel. Equal protection under the law says that all taxes have to be distributed equally. This is a discriminatory tax, your little dump fee tax for $100. It's unconstitutional. It's wrong. And if anyone goes into that dump and pays to dump a load, it should be the same. Property owner, because he's a property owner shouldn't have to pay more than the other people and most of the time those other people are contractors being paid to haul stuff away for somebody else and they don't have to pay the extra fee. There's a problem with this fee. Taxes should be equal among the people. You're public servants, you're paid by us. The people are being shanghai with this tax altogether. You need to consider repealing it. Up the fee at the gate for everybody. Then there's no issue and you won't have these problems. Thank you. I'm David Cusley from Hayfork. I have a uh, amount due of $135 for a solid waste parcel fee, and I didn't take care of it on time, obviously. That's why the extra $35 is on there. But this parcel is a mining claim, and we're required to not live there. We can't, I don't even camp there. When I do go there to do some work, I take whatever trash I have off site. I take it to the dump. And I also live in Hayfork and the family that owns the property where I live is already paying this fee, hundred dollar fee. So I would like to ask to have it waived. I, I don't think that this fee should apply to a mining claim. Is there a structure on the claim? No. I think you have a house to to pay the hundred dollars. Yeah. So, so I just uh, so the process to get that. Go ahead, explain. That's something that's carried over. That's always been in the parcel fee, and it was probably back when people were staying on those claims and working and generating the garbage to go with it. And it could be that we need to look at that and revise the way that's going. If you wanted to. Adjust it. But it, if there's no house on it, then there, he shouldn't be getting a bill at all, correct? It's developed, is the, is the term on it, which yeah. we automatically say house. But if there's, it goes by what the waste generation is on the property and developed normally, yes, in the house, but there have been instances where that isn't. But if he's not, if you're not using your house, you don't have to pay the fee, correct? There's a vacant fee. Right. Okay. So if nothing else, you would have a vacant fee that you could apply for. Yes, you could do that before June 30, or you want to adjust that now. One thing I problem I have is that I have to go to the county recorder to record assessment papers and all that kind of thing. And look, there could be I don't want that to be a hold up. I mean this to be a hold up. Okay. Thank you. What should I do? Just have a seat for oh, right okay. now. Thank you. Anybody else? Well, the, I haven't had a, a lot 
much moment, but the, the one on the front, uh, Ms. Rose, uh, situation is it's a little bit sorry. It's A A R I. Yeah. Yes. That's correct. And um, um, the last gentleman, I'd like to wait for 135 until we get that straightened out. Mining claim. Mining claim. Yes. Unoccupied mining claim. Currently unoccupied. It was at one point. And I, can, I can see the validity of the ordinance. And then the two other women who want to pay it in full by today, minus. Minus the 35. Mm -hmm. Diane, are you keeping track of all this? I'd like to have names and parcel numbers if I could, but if I get paperwork by the time I'm done, I'll be okay. Thank you. <laughs> Do you have the, the letter from her? Yes. Okay. You report us how many numbered pages that I'm looking for now. <laughs> So yeah, I'm trying to find the two letters that were in the back up. Uh, page three, 384. Okay. Right there. That's where they start. Uh, Lois Van Vilkow. Parcel number 007-540-23-0000. That's on her letter. Hopefully it's correct. And then there's a uh, Benton Cabin who, uh, with the second check for $30, second year he's had the problem. I don't understand what amount he wishes, or Benton wishes, uh, waived. Is it just a $30? He wants to make a payment of $30, which is a vacant fee on an unoccupied parcel. And is it listed as a as an unoccupied parcel with you? He has submitted paperwork that shows that, and I believe that it's one that we agreed could be okay. vacant if we had received it on time. So. Okay, so I'm fine with that one. And then the two from today that were added. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, and Robert Rose. I'm okay with that one to include in a motion to waive and um, the odd fellows I'm not because we went through this whole program where right. we put the uh, burden <coughs> away from the odd fellows onto the right that was discussed at your last yes. hearing so okay so I, I've moved that forward as a motion that Bobby also included unless Bobby wants to take it no I, I concur with everything and I appreciate your input, Keith, on the uh, odd fellows because that, that was a major thing right. that was going to say. Just a point of clarification on the one related to the binding claim, that was a late application. Are you waiving the late application on that? Yes. It would be a $435 waive. Correct, but, but the reason it was not included was based on the fact that it was a non timely application. Uh, we're actually questioning whether if she should have been charged the hundred dollars to begin with. Correct. What I'd recommend is just including in your motion that you're waiving the late filing. Okay. Absolutely. Thank you, Margaret. I get it now. <coughs> Takes me a minute or two or three. And then Diane, you've captured the two women who just spoke today. If they see I think me they're when both I'm done, then yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for putting up with us. Quite all right. Puzzle. Uh, Supervisor Chalet? Aye. Supervisor Benley? Yes. Supervisor Morris? Yes. Supervisor Martin? Yes. Supervisor Rose? Aye. All right. Thanks for every patient on that one. Yeah, thank, thank you everybody for coming today. <coughs> okay. On back to two reports and announcements. Report from CAO.
in a recent emergency, so I, I wrote it down so I wouldn't try not to forget anybody. Um, I don't have any county business to report, but if you would humor me, I'd like to do yes. this. Um, to start with the uh, Department of Transportation. Uh, they put in countless hours, making sure roads are clear, uh, or roads are blocked, or clearly marked, and they've also assisted law enforcement with those closures. Um, Rick Tippett has attended almost every incident command over in Anderson. has been uh, diligent in picking up and transporting supplies for law enforcement, so we have to pull uh, critical staff off of that. Our law enforcement has been uh, completely dedicated. As you heard, uh, all deputies were called, and several of the CEO, CEOs were assigned to patrol the work loose and protecting homes and businesses. For the first 10 days, none of them took any time off because of fatigue. They were given one day off a week. Most of them uh, refused to do that and stayed out on the, on the fire. As you heard from a uh, chief probation officer, um, our probation officer had been out assisting law enforcement, um, and they also have been housing our National Guard in the hall, so we should have our National Guard troops here. OES has been running 24 hours a day, staffed and monitoring all aspects of the fire, doing their best to inform residents of the activity. And I'd like to also thank our partners. We have CAL FIRE, we have U.S. Forest Service, CHP, Fish and Game, the State OES, uh, Attorney PUD, National Guard, Center of Fire's Office, Red Cross, and numerous volunteers have uh, been here the entire time serving to protect our community. And of course, our board members have been involved personally, uh, assisting and, and doing anything they can to, to, uh, to help these staff. So on behalf of the county, I'd just like to thank everybody who's been involved, and it's not over, and I'm fully confident that everybody's going to stay on until the job's done. Okay. Report from uh, board members, Supervisor Mines. Uh, nothing to report. Supervisor Penley. No out of county travel, but you have an important announcement. <laughs> Supervisor Chadley. I was able to attend on behalf of Trinity County um, my first National Association of Counties in uh, Tennessee, and uh, it was great. I would like to be able to <coughs> spend some time with CAO because. There's a lot of things that I um, learned. Now's not a good time. I brought a whole packet back, but there are things that happen on a national level, and um, uh, we have one vote uh, for the the VP, the second VP, and that's very important. And I have to say, I was totally ignorant on so many things that I think would be beneficial to um, board members to be able to collaborate um, and go forward on a national level. So. For those in the audience, if you go to NHCO, Nashville, Tennessee, you'll you'll get to see an um, incredible amount of um, very important things that are happening at a national level that has to do with our rural community here in California, um, the resilient uh, communities that uh, Graham started over on the coast after the Napa Sonoma is now all the way up at the national level. So there are many things that we can participate at a national level. So I was really honored to be able to participate in that on behalf of Trinity County. Okay, thank you. Supervisor Morris. Um, again, thank everyone who's been working on these fires for the last, I don't know, 10 days or more. Um, also want to recognize Supervisor Mines and his neighbors for jumping on that fire in Junction City with your shovels, and then the Forest Service showed up. Um, also want to thank uh, Congressman Huffman, Assemblymember Jim Wood for making a uh, very early donation to the shelter for things that uh, the evacuees um, may need in helping Red Cross. Um, of course, uh, I would have joined you at NACO had I not had car issues and were very aware of some of the, a lot of the federal issues that are going on. There's probably some new ones that just came up this year. Um, also, just to let you know, if you didn't see it, you might not have, because we've had uh, some county email issues. Um, the two joint chiefs money that uh, the collaborative applied for, I think it was in the tune of $2 million. Some of that work has been rolling out, but now um, Six Rivers is really, has just been uh, noted that some of that work on some of that project money is rolling out. Like the Rim Fire, the Yosemite Collaborative uh, has reached uh, many consensus, like our local collaborative. 
Um, but what the issue is, is a lack of resources um, to carry out some of the work on the ground for some major fuels reduction. Um, we will probably look to uh, help try and uh, attain some more money so we can uh, facilitate those projects on the ground uh, since the Forest Service budget keeps getting cut. So uh, stay tuned for some of that work. Okay, that's it? Mm -hmm. Unless I missed something. There. All right, uh, I had no out of county travel, but I do want to point out, um, I was in Lewiston several times at the new fire hall, and the people of Lewiston uh, have an amazing resiliency. Uh, the fact that they've been improving that town is the reason the town stands. So between the fact that they put in their new water system with the help of the state, the town would not have survived without that water system. Helicopters were taking about a thousand gallons a minute all day long. They were dumping over a hundred thousand gallons of retardant a day, and that was just two helicopters besides all the water trucks. So their tank that holds 350,000 gallons, they have backup generators to keep that tank full, is why the town is still there. With the fire hall became their main station, the, uh, the ladies were cooking dinners for between 50 and 75 people and then just feeding anybody who came in so um, it's, it was a whole community effort from from the very beginning all the way up to this top state officials so I um, just point that out to everybody all right with that we'll go to oh uh, the very important announcement uh, that the Trinity County Fair is this week this week this week yes all right and uh, just because it's smoky on this end, go to the fair and enjoy the fair. Spend a lot of money on those kids' animals. Oh yeah, that's coming up. I've already got mine picked out. Okay, all right. So, yes, that's you guys in the back too. Spend a lot of money. You can't afford it anymore. All right. Uh, report from ad hocs. Anything from the new cannabis legislation? Nope. I'm not going to report out, Judy. No. Okay. Uh, uh, the cannabis ordinance. We're still doing that. Well, we have some uh, the second reading of the two ordinances on our agenda today. And Keith and I um, will be looking to do some major cleanup and I think it'll just take a lot of major time on our part to uh, go back and do some cleanup that we've been proposing internally between the two of us and get that to the commission very soon as, as soon as possible. And that would be on cultivation. Cultivation. Yes. We, uh, retail will come at a separate time which that still needs to be worked on and funneled through the proper channels. I think that's it on those two. Okay. New jail. I apologize, I don't remember the date. It's, yeah, the RFP closes, it's this month, it's mid to latter part of this month, um, and it will be imperative for us to pick a contractor quickly because, as you know, there's going to be a lot of uh, rebuilding because of the fire, so us to secure a contractor is going to be imperative very quickly. So, as soon as we get those open, we'll probably go into negotiations to pick a contractor. Okay. COP refinancing. Do you, do you have anything new on that? Um, no, I Go ahead. No. Got, got to come up. Um, just, just a quick one. So basically, um, I'm hoping we had a few things that we needed to address, but hopefully in the next couple weeks I'll be able to come back with a couple numbers and we're circulating a um, an RFP to um, the bank. So hopefully we'll have some numbers to come back for you so in the next couple weeks. Okay, and then budget development? Yeah, we're, well, we're, we're kind of on hold right now. We're waiting until the final numbers come in September and also waiting for our, our analyst, uh, Craig, to be ambulatory again and then be replacement. So he's doing well, but he'll be back on here shortly. Um, uh, everything is, is going well. Okay, wilderness oversight? Yeah, he submitted a mid hit, so. Yeah, so. Um, 
it's the wilderness bill has been submitted. Um, what I'm going to ask, uh, he has asked for a letter of support from us. Um, and some some two items were taken out of the bill, which was the Bonanza King and some of the little spots along the boundary of the Trinity Alps, which were buffer zones. Um, but what I'm going to do at the next meeting is bring this open up, and I would like every board member to read the bill and then have their feelings what they feel about it. Um, and if there's suggestions to change, so our options would be to support it, uh, stay neutral on it, or uh, ask, uh, be against it with changes, and so those are the things that we would uh, want to discuss. So uh, every district has different viewpoints. I don't know the, the South District very well, so um, when it comes to the wilderness side of it. So I'm just asking everybody to read the bill, come up with your thoughts and ideas, and at the next meeting we'll agendize this to come up with a strategy of what we should do. That's all right. That's great. Do you want Mr. Driscoll here? Or? No, I think okay. at this point, I, we don't, I think That's fine. people just need to read what, what they've written. We, we've heard a lot of different analysis around. Um, and look at that fantastic map. And, and supposedly, they swear to me, they've got a new map. So. And then we'll open up to the public so the public can give us views to see where we want to yeah, that will be a pretty good subject, I would guess. All right, on to county matters. These items include non-routine or controversial matters that are listed alphabetically by department. A member of the board staff or public may request that an item be heard out of order. Okay, and before we start, we're going to take a 10-minute um, break. Precisely 10. Somewhere between an hour and three days.
Fiscal year 17 18 in the tax um, treasurer tax collector department increased salary and benefits by 34,120 prior period expenses by 1,433 and transfers in by 50,000 and decreased revenues by 39,614 services and supplies by 8518 and interfund expenses by $500. Approve a budget adjustment for 1718 in the contingency fund department. Increase appropriations for contingency by 16,149. Approve a budget adjustment for fiscal year 1718 in the tax collector fund for cost department. Uh, 8638. Increasing transfers out by 50,000. Increase to the general fund appropriations of 26535 Current balance in contingency fund is 16807 Contingent on prior requests being approved and current cash balance and tax collector fund for cost fund 638 is $179,191. What's that mean? Good morning. <laughs> it means it's been an interesting year for us. So uh, basically what you have before you is, um, I gave a lot more detail in the staff report, but it's been kind of an unprecedented year for us. We've had um, quite a few things that came up over the year that, you know, we always strive to do the best that we can to um, 
work with what we have, um, and we I try to do our best not to complain. I always feel just complaining. Always just all that basically does change people's opinion of you. But this year, it was basically out of our control, and I tried to lay that out for you in the staff report to make you aware of all the things that were outside of our control that contributed to be coming before you to make this this budget adjustment. Um, and that's why I'm here today to make you aware of everything that we went through to lead us here. So. It's a very clear thing. All right, any questions? Um, your summary was amazing, and I want to thank you for that. And I. I see some systemic problems that would be rolling over to next year as well that you had talked about, and I would just encourage you to, um, if somehow we can be pre proactive and get in front of some of those things. I know health we can't, but I want to commend you that this, you in your summary, you say this is the first time in 10 years that you've been before the board with an adjustment like this. So that's to be noted and congratulated. Thank you. I've not asked for contingency funds before, and I've mentioned that to the budget committee and made them aware of my concerns. And I do feel that there's going to be an, an issue, and there is um, going to be some staff that's going to be on extended and extended leave, and um, some of those things are going to affect the general fund and, and your discretionary dollars. So that that will be impacting this year's budget. So, so I do have some concerns. Any comments from the public? That will bring it back and entertain a motion. Move to approve 5.9 as presented. Second. All right. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Same sign? All right. All right. 5.3 approve the budget adjustment for 1718 in the contributions to other fund department increasing transfers out by 4184 approve a budget adjustment for 1718 in the contingency general fund department decreasing appropriations for contingency by 4184 approve a budget for 1718 in the emergency service OES increasing revenues by 36329 Service and supplies by 30,318, fixed assets by 16,496, and transfers in by 4,184, and decrease interfund expenses by 1,852. Increase in general funds appropriations of 4,184. Current contingency balance is 33,338. Contingent on prior request being approved, and current cash balance emergency service fund is. 137468. Good morning. Uh, this budget adjustment is based on the management of the OES grants that we had. Um, we discovered that there were some inner fund expenses that were not covered through the grants. Um, and so that, that made us have to look for the contingency general fund. Um, moving forward, we are making arrangements that these expenses are going to be direct charged because the issue was if the expense is not just directly to the OES department, it could not be shared with other departments. So inner fund expenses are not allowed. So we are making arrangements to not have that happen again. Uh, for example, internet service. That has to be a separate direct charge to OES. So um, again, this is one-time request, and it should be able to allow us to close out the year in a balanced manner. Okay, any questions? Okay, open up the public. Okay. Come on, back. So moved. Second. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Same sign. Okay. <laughs> Go out there and help everybody <laughs> okay 5.1 approve a budget adjustment for 1718 in the elections department increase interfund expense by 10,487 approve a budget adjustment 17, uh, for fiscal year 1718 in the contingency general fund decreasing the appropriations for contingency by 10,487 
increase, increase general fund appropriations of 10487 Current balance for appropriation for contingency is 60825 Good morning. Good morning, John. Um, these were unanticipated costs due to court cases. This is why we're asking for more contingency money. Okay. Any questions? Nope. Okay. Open up to the public. Kay Graves from Lewiston. Um, reading the backup material, uh, I understand that it seems odd that if you have an election contest against, uh, that you actually sue the candidate and not the person that ran the election. And that seems to be something that's written in your backup material that you might want to clarify or find out whether that's correct or not. Because it seems odd, but that's the way the court does it. The other thing is all of these costs are borne by the taxpayers in this county me being one of them. Um, not only do I have a direct stake in it because I have to pay for the court costs, I have a direct stake because I am a voter. All of these could have been alleviated. We shouldn't be paying all this. Um, if there were simple remedies and they weren't taken. It was the obstinance and I don't know what it was with uh, not uh, correcting errors. A lot, both of these were errors that could have been corrected. I'm sure if we used Mr. Finley's money, they would have been corrected in August. But we're using, no, I'm talking about what's in the backup material and on your um, uh, cover sheet, what's written there. And these things, um, <laughs> we're, we're paying for these and they should have been cleared up. They can still be cleared up. And that's what you need to do instead of taking more of our taxpayer money. Thank you. Hi, Jay Grossman, Chris Tate for uh, You're going to have to forgive my ignorance, but I had this, uh, I heard mentioned that this increase was from unforeseen court case costs. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. uh, is that just having to do with this whole voter thing, or is that with? Unforeseen court case costs overall in Trinity County. It's just the voters. Okay. Any other public comment? Diane Richards, Hay Fork. Um, basically, you're throwing good money after bad here. Uh, the elections office should be cooperating rather than using the county council as a firewall. Most of the um, items that are asked for are public records and they're fighting to not get public records. Um, in the, also, if the election office had run the, the election the way they're supposed to by the law, there wouldn't even be an election contest, etc. There would not be legal ramifications. But they refuse to cooperate with um, even the uh, Republican uh, Central Committee. They refuse to cooperate with the observers putting themselves in this position. If they had cooperated, they would have um, been advised, you know, follow the law, do this or that. And that would have helped them. Instead, they completely ignore the public and have gotten themselves in this position. And so now you're going to give more money so that they can fight the public trying to make the election correct. And that's what we're trying. We, we contacted you. I know uh, Chair Gross came in and we said, look what they're doing. They're not letting us observe properly. You saw it with your own eyes. If they had cooperative, cooperated, it would have avoided all this, but they didn't. Instead, they decided to ignore election law. And you're just going to give them more money in order to fight the public getting documents. That's what we're trying to do is get the documents be able to see the things that we are allowed to see, observe as we're allowed to observe. This is what it's all about. And you're continuing to throw good men money after bad. Any more public comment? All right, we bring it back. Um, 
I'm looking for a motion. I'd like to make a motion under clerk to recorder assessor to approve 5.1 as presented. And she'd recuse, so I'd like to make a subsequent motion. We don't have a second. Second. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. Subsequent? I would like to um, request that we send this to the Attorney General to be clear on the fact that we can, as a board, spend this money in this way with the public funds. I agree. Um, do we have a second? Subsequent dies. Margaret, are you are you trying to say something or? Nope, I'm just looking. Okay. All right. With that, please. Uh, all in favor, signify by, by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Aye. Okay. Passes four to one. All right. Five point two. Approve a budget adjustment for FY 17-18 for Board of Supervisors increasing uh, service and supplies by 17,000 approve a budget adjustment for 17-18 contingency <coughs> general fund department decreasing appropriations for contingency by 17,000 increase in general fund appropriations of 17,000 current balance for appropriations for contingency is 50,338 contingent on prior request being approved. On that reading, I would like to request to recuse myself. Okay. Thank you, sir. We will call you back in when we're done. Thank you. Richards, Hay Fork. Okay. What you're doing and what you have done, you're up to 140000 on this case, um, is a crime every time you make a payment. It is a felony. That's Penal Code 424, Misappropriation of Public Funds. Um, there has now been filed a case against this to get an injunction against what you're doing. It's in the court right now. They're finding a judge for it. Um, and we will prevail because of a co uh, California, besides the Constitution, but there's a California Supreme Court case, Danson versus Mott, and it says that um, a public agency may not expend public funds to promote a partisan position in election campaign. The court noted, a fundamental precept of this nation's democratic electoral process is that the government may not take sides in election contests or bestow an unfair advantage of one of several competing factions. A principal danger feared by our country's founders lay in the possibility that the holders of the government authority would use official powers improperly to perpetuate themselves or their allies in office. The selective use of public funds in election campaigns, of, of course, raises the specter of just such an improper distortion of the democratic electoral process. That's what, why we're going to prevail and why you're going to be in trouble. You need to, every payment you make is actually a felony. It's a count. You need to stop it. You need to come to the table 
and say, okay, we were wrong. You can go to the Attorney General, but the Attorney General has already ruled on this um, before. I think it was in 1990. You cannot do this, and you're continuing to do it. We've told you several times. We brought it up. You've been on public notice. Now you're in court with us. Any other public comment? Okay, with that, we'll bring it back. Does anybody have questions for Margaret? Margaret, do you have any comments? Again, we don't comment on active litigation. I would, of course, caution both sides not to attempt to influence or uh, intimidate uh, defendants or plaintiffs in cases, uh, and remind the board that on uh, budget adjustments, it does require uh, four fifths votes. Okay. And if the board were to deny this, it would uh, constitute a breach of the contract for the uh, retained attorney. All right. Any other questions? I'm looking for a motion. Um, I make a motion to approve 5.2 as presented. Second. I'll make a subsequent motion that we um, refer this to the AG, requesting his input on whether or not this is legal. from um, um, lack a second I will point out we have had legal counsel on this um, so just for the record we'll do a roll call supervisor Morris yes supervisor Mines yes supervisor Chauver abstain supervisor Gross uh, yes it uh, is defeated so we will come back and see what we can uh, see what we can do. A moment of clarification, Ad, I will have to confirm, but I do believe an abstention and this constitute, constitute an I. So, but let me let me confirm that and come back to you. Okay. Will you do that today or later on? I'll do it right now. We're working with the next item. I'll let the CIO know shortly. Okay. Y'all need to make more coffee. Don't want to ask you to be removed. Please keep it down. All right, on to 3.4, excuse me, 5.4. Adopt a resolution which establishes non-represented management classification salary and benefits, effective July 1st, 18, approximately 4,166 for FY 2018-19. And would somebody please ask Mr. Finley to come back in? Public with this item. 
All right, we'll come back up. Looking for a motion. Motion to approve by God four as presented. Second. This is a resolution. Please do the roll call. Supervisor Chowick? Aye. Supervisor Finley? Yes. Supervisor um, Morris? Yes. Supervisor Mines? Yes. Supervisor Grove? Aye. All right, on planning and zoning, waive the reading and enact ordinance amending Trinity County Zoning Ordinance 315, adding section 43.1, pertaining to commercial cannabis micro business license introduced July 17th, 2018. Okay, thank you. And is that for the following item also? Yes. All right, thank you, Mr. Myers. Yes, Leslie. Well, yes, would, you, would you like me to introduce it? Well, I'll take it. You did make it up. Well, that's my copy. Oh. <laughs> so this is the second reading since July 17th. We made some minor changes. Um, we took out... Page three of six, uh, letter I, if I'm not mistaken. We also um, added the, okay, it's not on my copy, so I'm going to bear with me. And you can, Leslie, do you have it handy right in front of you? Sure do. Yep, we added the license types under two regulations. That's right. Section two. We also are moving uh, forward to the commission. Um, did we? Are we moving RR for consideration under this item as well? If I recall, it's, it's, it seems like it was months ago, but it was only a month ago. It would be RR for manufacturing, right? As, as you recall, the any changes would be into the manufacturing or distribution or retail licenses. This just refers to those ordinances. Correct, which would then be incorporated into micro business if approved. Does that all make sense to everybody? Um, those were really it for micro business, unless I'm missing something. No? Okay. No, that's, that's the changes we made last time. Yes, go ahead. Um, the, the new maps. I didn't see them in the back of um, the, the, I'm trying to look for where, where, what page it referred it to. So sorry. Well, the, the location where it says, and it's like not Diablo and it gives latitude and longitude, but I did not look at, do you have the maps? That's the Bucktail subdivision. And we did not include a, we not included a map. Um, it's just been the legal description of the Bucktail subdivision. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's a, yeah. It, just the roads that were very specific to the subdivision okay. that were created. I understand now. I just yeah. didn't, I haven't seen that before, and I didn't know if it was a new location. Thank you. I'll, I appreciate the I'll send them to you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? No. All right, we'll open it up to the public. Kevin Manessi in Hayport. I think so, guys. Wow, this week is out today. <laughs> anyway, um, my biggest concern, I want this to go through, but we need to do it fast, and I don't know. Um, got notice from the BCC and the CDFA. Um, all the temporary licenses, if you don't have your temporary state license by the end of this month, you will not be able to get an extension for the 90-day extension at the end, because if your temporary license expires after the first of the year, you're going to have to be ready then. You're not going to get that other 90 days. So I'm wondering if there's a way we're going to be able to get a temporary license issued to us from the county like in the next week or couple of days so we can get our state one before the end of the month. Otherwise, we're getting short at 90 days to get to be in full compliance. Um, 
I know we got a temporary from the uh, cultivation this time, not a provisional, if we can get the same thing, or even an authorization to proceed at the state level. We got to have our state temporary by the end of this month, or we're short at 90 days. So we've already been held back seven months on this for this year. Everybody else got to start the first of the year. Only other question I have is this going to come back for some work soon? Um, there's a thing in there we can only have six customers per day, week, as a micro business in there. Um, I don't know what business can operate with only six customers coming around a week. Anyway, thank you very much. Matt Hawkins, Douglas City. Um, I was also. I would like to strongly urge the board to consider unclassified, also with for the manufacturing arm of a micro business license. I know you guys just said you're going to send it back to the planning commission for rural residential, right? Uh, why not unclassified as well? I don't see a huge difference in that. I think it's absolutely vital for a small farmer such as myself survival to be able to vertically integrate and make our own water hash. You know, we're talking about mesh bags and ice water and cannabis. This is not dangerous. If I can run in a woodworking shop in my garage, then I think I should be able to process my own water hash too. So please, please, please consider unclassified when you send that back to the planning commission. Thank you. Jay Grossman, Crest, Hay Fork. Uh, I would urge the board, um, and I think specifically the C CAO, <coughs> uh, to figure out whatever the heck we have to do to get this stuff passed. As, as you've heard, you know, the state feels like they've given ample time for everybody to come to the table. Um, when micro business farmers uh, or other folks with a, a, a huge amount of different issues having to do with the county go to the state and say, hey, this is the business model we're going to do. We're working towards it. There's things out of our control to hold it up. The state has kind of lost their smiley little face of being like, oh, we understand, you're trying to come in. They're at the point now where they're saying, you've had plenty of time. When you tell them, it's out of our hands, it's planning, it's supervisors, it's the county, it's whatever, I'm not pointing any fingers at specific people, but whatever it is, the state's like, kind of, well, sorry. And I understand that happens on a local level too, where the planning department has people that aren't genuinely trying to move forward with things, and they've gotten to the point that they're saying, well, sorry. But we got to figure this stuff out. I, you know, I don't know if it's do away with this ordinance, put a cap on it, take a fee so that the county still is getting a fee, and let the state regulations ride, and let us follow state regulations. We can drain the swamp. I mean, not the swamp. Sorry, the planning department. We can drain the planning department. We can move forward and have farms operating here. That, like I am. You guys have heard me talk for years now, and I am truly at a loss of words of how to describe what is going on out here. And now we're sitting here essentially kicking the smallest farmers in our county, which are beyond the smallest farmers in our state. We're just kicking them in the mud right now, kicking them in the mud. And getting through this, you know, the, the county stuff is just a, 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 a tiny hurdle to what we have to do with the state. And now we've got guys that are facing, and girls facing, not being able to get extensions for temporary license from the state, not being able to, and now that the market's opened up, or we can actually, if we work with somebody out of our county, we can actually legally sell our product that goes into a tax base that helps our state. But it just feels like that's physically impossible here. Thank you. Once again, John Brower from Junction City, and uh, yeah, there's a couple fatal flaws in this ordinance as written. I, yeah, it's it's good that it's going to get sent back to the Planning Commission to consider rural res for micro business, but <clears throat> all along the way, as these other license types have been bouncing their way through the Planning Commission, each time 
that rural residential or unclassified, these other zoning types have been brought up for these essential commercial cannabis license types, manufacturing, distribution, obviously the two most important right now. Um, each time we were told, well, that will come with microbusiness. Only it hasn't come with microbusiness. The conversation got hijacked into uh, uh, cottage industry and during two planning commission, two really important planning commission meetings got wasted trying to cram this subject into our existing cottage industry ordinance, which is a great ordinance. <coughs> but it is vital that the mom and pops that are out there doing this right have a shot in this thing and to keep them from participating as a microbusiness just doesn't make sense. We've got to open it up to these other zoning types. And to, to say that, well, you can only have manufacturing, a manufacturing license type operate as a microbusiness, um, if it could already qualify as a manufacturer, like as currently written, the for a participant that has the right zone property to be a micro business, well, why would they when they can already become that full license type? It just, I only know of one single cultivator in the county that is interested in the micro business as currently written. Only one. That's a travesty. This could be a great fit for Trinity. It really could. So we've got to open it up to these other zoning types. Of course people need to be able to make hash on their cultivation site or what would be a manufacturing premises in association with their cultivation site. We're not talking about volatile solvents. We're talking about perfectly safe and sane manufacturing methods that can easily find a safe home in a rural residential setting. It's already going on. And so I encourage that to be taken seriously and incorporated into this. Thank you. Welcome back, Liz. Thank you. Good morning. Liz McIntosh, Junction City. You know, I agree with all these comments that have already been said, and if you've got to pass something to pass something and make it a full-on ordinance, then move forward. That said, I would highly encourage you to really, really consider some of the other comments out here today. Write an ordinance that does go to the state. Take your fees. We've waited three years, and it's killed most of us, me included. So all these small people, like creating a narrow pathway is wonderful in some ways. There is a pathway, we can say that. But it's so narrow that most of us have fallen off, and then it leads many of us to start thinking if that's not the intended goal. And so we're hurting ourselves. We look at the car fire, we want to like support tourism and that kind of thing. And one thing I've learned, I already knew, but learned that we can't depend on the weather for our economy. We can't sink everything into tourism. We wrote those beautiful policies about doing this in a way that supports tourism and like these micro business guys only getting six people out there or doing, I don't know if that supports tourism and that kind of thing. And, and I just would like to see us have some kind of real economy and the state has made it hard enough but what's been going on at the county level, and I know you guys are conflicted, I know you've got a lot of people battling it out, and still the moral battle rages on, but we're wasting away. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, we'll bring it back to the board. So I just want to clarify, I don't believe we talk about customers, we just talk about employees. Is that correct? Yeah, okay. because you're not allowed to have retail it's, customers it's, at We this haven't time. done retail yet, so the customer portion is not part of this micro business. I think it's on page 530. It's um, under F2. The micro business does not generate more than two non-employee vehicles visiting the licensed premises at any one time, or no more than six non-employee vehicles per week doesn't call them customers, but if, if, that, if you're the retail person, that would mean that you are only allowed to have six customer in a week. So that's why they said it. Okay, thank you for that clarification. That is not the intention. So do we need to make that a little more clear? Well, they don't have the ability to sell at 
the facility, so they're not customers. Yeah. But they could at a future date. Right, and that will be a retail license. It's wrapped up in that. It's part of it. Should there be a definition of customer? Or is there one of the definitions? Not at this time, because we don't have It's a non-storefront retail right. is the only portion of the micro. So may I ask a question? Is this anywhere in the BCCs or any other cannabis regulations, or is this specifically for Trinity County? That was entirely generated from the planning commission. I, I missed your question. If this, if this ruling was in any other regulation, a BCC or a regs or if there's multiple agencies now, or if this was a standalone from Trinity County, it's a standalone from the no, Which part of it? Um, F2. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's in our zoning ordinance through the, that's been trying to manipulate through the uh, home college. And if everyone recalls from months ago when this was first introduced, the retail portion at, at the moment only applies to non-storefront retail. So when we go to do retail in its entirety, we will look at that aspect of customers coming to your place. This, at the moment, in order to have some retail component, is just stated as the non-storefront retail. Am I remembering that right? Because it's been yes, that's not how my recollection is. So the micro business is a standalone license that incorporates multiple things that someone can do. It should not be confused whatsoever with a cottage industry um, that Trinity County offers if you want to make salsa or bread to go to the, the um, farmer's market. Micro business is specifically only um, advocating for cannabis uh, retail, cultivation, distribution, and there's one other one, a part of that, that you have to pick four of the five. Our cottage industry laws that we established was to help people be able to generate from their kitchens mostly and gardens a, a pathway to uh, to get an income. Mm -hmm. The micro business and the cottage industry are two two separate things that I would like to see stay separate. Um, so I don't remember that in the past at, at all whatsoever. So the problem with with what you're saying is is that actually stiffens the regulations. The, the home cottage was used through the, through the existing zoning ordinance to allow this to come into smaller smaller zones. Uh, without that, then, then we would have a real difficult time getting this to fit into a zoning ordinance. Uh, I don't, I don't, I, when did we marry the cottage and micro businesses? Because apparently I wasn't in that conversation. Uh, months ago, and it's been to the PC. Okay. Yeah, that's, it's changed again. It's been somewhat reduced. Yeah, the PC streamlined it. They did a good job when it came to them. We, uh, we had a little more cumbersome, uh, and then they turned around and streamlined it to make it fit uh, much better. So that's been, I don't know, and we sent, it's got to be three or four months ago. Right. And we took some of the verbiage from cottage industry so we can tier it. So those who are very small, if they fell into a certain group of parameters, they would just only need a director's use permit versus having to make them go get a conditional use permit. At a certain level, then it flips over to the conditional use permit requirement. So some of those parameters were kind of framed or pivot off of the cottage um, ordinance just to have some clarification between the two levels. So not everybody in a micro business then is forced to do a conditional use permit. We try to find a two levels, depending on your size, where you would need to go, a quicker path or a longer path? If I may, mm -hmm. yes, when we were looking at the college industry, you had three levels. You had no permits, no use permits, director's use permits, and 
you full on use permits. And the problem was, was there's, if we tried to apply that, then there was situations where you'd end up in a director's use permit where we were just tending on it being a or you need a full direct full use permit where we just tended on a P and director's use permit. And then there's a lot where we didn't get any permit where we wanted to have some sort of permit. So what they did was they drew a line between director's use permit and full use permit. And uh, that was using the spirit of the cottage industry, they drew it, but they took a lot of the connections out and put it to where um, essentially the, uh, where you switch from the use permit was based on number of employees and based on uh, uh, the number of hours that you had people, folks working out there. And that was where it triggered whether you were in a director's use permit or in a full-on use permit. So, so the, what we're hearing, and I think people are misunderstanding, that you can't have the two employee vehicles the, the F2 that you stated. That's not true. What it says is if you generate more than the two non-employed uh, vehicles, you then qualify, you have to go to a conditional use permit. Correct. So we're not saying you can't do it, we're saying that you have to meet a higher standard of, of permitting. So it's not stopping it, it's just if you're this X small, then you use a director's use permit. If you're this small, you have to go to conditional use permit. So it's it's essentially everything needs a director's use permit unless you're a certain size. It's bigger than you need a start public car. Um, is it not? Um, somebody's going to have to remind me. It is. Where at. I've waited years for the moment a conversation like this ensues during public comment. <laughs> okay. Um, I'll, I'll give you a chance in just a second. Thank you. So the the planning commission has talked about this marriage between the micro and the cottage. Um, I I clearly don't have a recollection of us doing it, and so the cottage. The whole idea of, of, of that going forward was to have the most minimum impact of um, the county being regulating. It was specifically at that time to help people literally get out food at farmers markets and, and, and even like from your own kitchen. Very limited. You had to you had to sign a thing saying you wouldn't have your dogs and your cats in the kitchen. If you got a complaint, then somebody would come. It was very very not managed, and that I think is a good thing. I think government should leave us alone unless we're doing something wrong. The micro businesses are are not those that is specifically cannabis. And to marry the two, it seems like what we're doing is we're trying to find the most difficult pathway for the cannabis community to go forward and that's why they feel like these are obstacles because they are obstacles in their pathway going forward. So, so, so your option here is we just go to a conditional use permit. Mm -hmm. Call it good. I mean this is this whole thing is designed to make it easier. Um, and, and, and but no, if, if we don't want to use the home, we, we just make it a conditional use permit and move on. And there's no cottage industry in there anymore. It was used as a structure of guideline for us. So, and I'll give you an example. There's a common in there, uh, G, which is about vehicle usage, if it's on a common driveway. That was actually something that was pulled out of out of the cottage industry and moved over there. But the the way this works compared to the cottage industry are two different animals. Um, we headed down, we started a little bit down that road, but we found out it didn't work. And so we broke off and went back to just either a use permit, director's use permit, or a conditional use permit. And, and uh, what the size of your business is what dictated one of the two you mentioned yet. 
Okay, since I'm told that we're still in public, I'm going to Jay. <coughs> Jay Gross from Chris Tayfork again. Uh, so over two employee vehicles, you need a CUP? Uh, or whatever the size differentiation is? Non-employee vehicles. Okay, so we have a new saying in Trinity County in the cannabis industry that it's not a CUP, it's a see you next year. Okay? Olivia's CUP was the first submitted for a Type 3. I still have not heard... I mean, at least Leslie stopped giving us dates. So, my guess is, maybe next year we'll see it. We're pushing on like eight months now. That's like, I know that there are these restrictions in the way that our county has been set up, and I obviously wish that we had an updated general plan and everything could be hunky-dory and great, and I get that we're working through these avenues. And especially yourself, Mr. Groves, you have way more experience with all of this and how it all works than I will ever have, hopefully. I really hope to never have the experience you're doing this. But we've got to figure something out. Because if you're going to tell these anybody who wants, like, essentially a successful micro business that's going to have more than just, like, two cars coming up, they're going to need a CUP. We farmed that out to a third party to allegedly expedite it, which is now like, I can tell you, I'm not even planning on ever growing an acre in Trinity County. Doesn't mean I'm stopping trying, but it seems so asinine and, and there's no way it's ever going to happen. And now you guys are essentially telling people that if you want a successful micro business, you need to do that? That's like, for lack of a better term, insane and you might as well just tell them to go out of business. Thank you. And thank you for letting me speak. May I turn? Yes, we're still in open. Uh, good morning, board, Chairman. Justin Hawkins from Hayport. Um, I also kind of have a lot of um, hesitation about the CUP process and the speed at which it's moving, and I think that that's a result of staffing and you know, the enormous pressure that that planning department's under, and I, I mean, the building department's under even more incredible pressure now, especially with the fires and getting over from Reading. So, um, my hope, though, is that um, maybe the board, if it's their pleasure, and I, I think it's been discussed before, can find a way to involve the community at large with a steering committee, perhaps, that can kind of try and maybe address a lot of these issues ahead of time. And I only say that to save everyone trouble here. And there are people like myself who spend almost every mo moment of their life thinking about cannabis policy. So um, I think that there's people in the community who would love to try and help. And maybe some of these issues could have even been rectified before. And I know that it's gone through the Planning Commission multiple times, and I appreciate the ad hoc's work. I'm just thinking that there could be more people involved. Thank you. All right, last chance for public comment. Resist. I really think we have to do, Lisa Barrow, Hayfork. I really think that we have to be really clear about we, we got to make a shift. We started this process out deciding we were going to control and regulate. And I think we got to make the shift to incentivize. I think these businesses are dying. And I think we got to create, I don't know what the pathway is, but we got to change the mindset. We got to incentivize. We've already done a lot of damage. We've already lost a whole bunch of people. We got to shift. We got to get to incentives. Okay. Thank you. Okay. With that, we're closed. Rick, the public did remind me of something I requested at last meeting that you're going to give the board. Um, update on those CUPs. I know you we the ad hoc got one, but I think it's important to give the board. So next meeting, can we, uh, in your board report, uh, make sure we have get that? And for fire free on the application. Um, because there, there are a lot of questions why SHN isn't moving forward as quick as possible. So I'd like the board to hear the whole 
yeah. just an update of where they're at and how many licenses are going through the process. We'll get that. Yeah. Thank you. Um, going back to something that Kevin said early, and he's he's mentioned it a few times, and, and Margaret, I think uh, when this was before the board, oh gosh, I'm going to say early May, and we thought this was going to be done by mid-June or so, um, there's this process of the state licensing. Um, and I think your comment to him was, and, and I think we've done this before, that people can apply for the state license um, as they're going through our process. Do you remember that conversation? That's hard to see here, of course. Is that a question for me, Judy? Yes, sorry, Mark. I do recall that conversation, yes. So, you know, it's kind of a two path forward. Um, clearly, Kevin, if Kevin was to call the state for his micro business license and we're still processing, uh, he just is in the queue with the state, especially now that there's a new deadline for, for these temp licenses. So, can you reiterate that for all of us? Well, I think that was a very specific situation, but the recommendation is, is as you're going through the process, specifically as you're getting very close to finalizing, um, that there is no harm in applying for the state license. What they do do is submit a document to us uh, where we confer with planning and other departments to make sure to see where you are, and, and we can have that communication with the state to let them know um, some details if things are being delayed or things are going on that will keep you in that proper queue. Okay. Thank you. Um, I do you think those were my last two things. Um, I think the confusion also uh, to my ad hoc partner and to the rest of the board is folks who want to, you know, do small um, farming as opposed to somebody who wants to just full on do manufacturing in an industrial zone. Um, there is again this different kind of level of participation. So Leslie or Rick, when you are bringing this back to the commission, and by that I mean, I mean you're taking some aspect of manufacturing back to the commission as we discussed, uh, and, and we'll go to this further when the item comes up, but Type S, RR, Egg Forest, are you framing it in terms of its application through micro business, like I don't. There just seems to be a link that's missing for consideration. Like perhaps we're not going to allow straight on just sole manufacturing in RR. There's a certain type of I think it was type S. I mean type six we were looking at that was mechanical, non volatile, uh, small. Type six under manufacturing. We were looking at a subset of right. six to send back and, and talk about, and that's going to go back to the commission. Um, so I just want to make sure the commission's understanding, you know, how it kind of links back into micro business. Um, and then, you know, the gentleman today brought up the issue about unclassified. We have a lot of cultivators in unclassified region who might want to do something. Well, I, I will say. You know, we'll listen to what they have, but it's called unclassified. That means classified. What did I say? No, it means unclassified should be all unclassified should be classified. Mm -hmm. Well, right. And so that's the easiest. And, and I know we don't have an answer to what to classify it to, but it's it's not. It is a it is a real zone, but it's a zone that is in holding pattern to be put into another pattern. So, I mean, that's going to be my answer to that. <laughs> I'm just, what else? I mean, I'm, shall we start talking about something else? Well, you're also? still in the room, so I, I, I appreciate that. Barely, absolutely barely. <laughs> appreciate that. <laughs> so, this is the final reading. If, if there's any made changes made today, we'll have to go back to a first reading. Um, so, what is the will of the board? I move to approve as presented. 
with those changes from last time, of course. Okay, this is a ordinance, so. Supervisor Chadwick? Aye. Supervisor Morris? Aye. Supervisor Benway? Yes. Supervisor Gross? Aye. Apparently you guys have. I'd like to keep track of that. Okay. All right, 5.6, waiver reading and enacting ordinance amending Trent County Zoning Ordinance 3.15 by adding section 343.2 pertaining to cannabis manufacturing introduced on July 17th. Okay, so we have the amendment to subset in manufacturing that is going to go that section is going to go back to the planning commission and that's for consideration of our, our egg forest um, and the type s license did i miss anything leslie no, they can talk about it unclassified if they want i mean it's once and it opens can, up they can we talk can about throw it. it unclassified at this point would be our suggestion other than that um, it came as the first reading, um, including Ag Preserve. And was there any other real big changes we made? C, 2C. Sorry, yeah, 2CB. That, that um, it was not allowed in the car back. I'm sorry, you're right. But not allowed in the specified specified and, but this is the part of the process of taking hay fork out of the car or carbon or whatever you want to <laughs> so that would be Cocker Creek Training Center and Lewiston and Creek Train Center in Lewiston, but it's just the historic district in Weird Hall, not in the That's cannabis true. cultivation program. And that was it for the first reading. Okay. And then we sent those other types back to PC. So this could move forward while those other little items get addressed at PC, which we hope would go before on September 9th, is kind of the day we talked about. Okay, any other questions? All right, open up the public on this one. John, when you look around, that just means you just <laughs> <laughs> gave you a chance to close it. <laughs> Good morning, once again, John Brower. Uh, the manufacturing's bounced its way through the process, you know, also, and um, I think too try to distinguish, the state has already done an excellent job of distinguishing between type 7 and type 6 manufacturing. For us to further try to break that apart is just folly. It, it, it just makes us uncompetitive and kicks our people in the knees once again to tell them that, oh, you can do part of type 6, but you can't do type 6. Type 6 is type 6. I think to, to break it down even further into mechanical is just a mistake. Why can you not use CO2 in a, in a you know, other setting? It's already not available in rural res, but it should be, type 6. And um, the, the, go ahead. Go ahead and stop this time, sir. 
So the answer on that is is that tr this would be not for the manufacturing, but under the micro site to allow. Right. The planning commission already said they didn't want ethanol extractions in rural residential. So this is saying, okay, you don't have that, but what about this? So it's to enlarge. We'll call you back when you're done, Jay. Um, enlarge what it can happen. I, I hear you on that, um, but the once again this the, this this overlap between micro business and these other licensed types is really important. The devil's in the details, and to to see, the whole time we were going through this manufacturing and distribution, we were told, "Oh, we'll look at micro business completely separately," and that is not that's not what has happened. So, I, I encourage some means of manufacturing on rural res, obviously. And I think the state has already done a great job of separating those types, type 6 and type 7. I think um, to, uh, to further limit Trinity folks is, is just a mistake. Um, some ethanol is required for cleanup in any sort of hash making scenario and um, it just seems like the state has already done this work for us um, the once again the conditional use permit process uh, um, has taken a while the rest of the state's up and running we're still talking about it um, all of our current cultivators have to work with an outside distributor outside manufacturers um, and so I would really like to see this process streamlined, and we would all love to hear an update from SHN um, on how they're doing on this. Um, I think uh, if we're relying on them for much of this heavy lifting, they should be in the room and be giving us frequent updates. Um, and uh, you know, I, I encourage the adoption of this ordinance. I encourage, I encourage you guys approving this ordinance today. It can help people get up and running, but it does need to be more inclusive. There's lots of different types of manufacturing, and the type six should be allowed in rural res. It's it's really important. Um, so it, instead of only sending the planning commission the option of approving mechanical concentrations, I think we should offer them the option of that or type six. It didn't really get properly sussed out at the Planning Commission, this notion of Type 6 and rural res. Again, the conversation got hijacked that night and went down a completely different path. It's only got talked about for a few minutes at the end of a long night. And many of these long Planning Commission meetings um, end up late at night with everybody in the room frustrated and ready to go home and they're not really doing their complete work before handing you these complex subjects. In hindsight it would have been great if we could have more of a workshop setting prior to the Planning Commission public hearings. And this stuff could get sussed out I think much better but again we're late to the game here and I encourage the adoption of this today as written, I think the Planning Commission should have greater options for manufacturing or rural res presented to them, not just mechanical. Good morning, Chair, remaining, remaining members of the board. Um, I like the idea of, of trying to find a way to allow for manufacturing in different zones and this idea of the mechanical extraction being separated out. I just think that in, pre in, in actual applications can be kind of tricky and it is delineating from the original idea, I believe, as I recall, of all the cannabis ordinances to kind of mirror the state. And I think that there's a quite a bit of misconception about the manufacturing process and the whole stigma around the hydrocarbon in particular solvents. Um, ethanol kind of gets grouped in there and I agree that it is somewhat volatile, although typically at normal temperatures it's a liquid um, in the room. It's not 
a vapor, which is really where the danger is. But what I would say is, though, is that the state has really gone over, and having read the state's rules on this, they're pretty strict about the type of safety mechanisms that you can employ with these extraction equipment. And I think that the state in, has gone over this quite a bit, and I think if the manufacturer is able to follow the state standards, safety can be ensured for the public in zones um, where it may not be perceived as being safe right now. And I was, I've been at the Planning Commission meetings also. The meeting this was heard, I think it got out after 11 p.m. Very long day, and I gotta tell you, everyone was exhausted, myself included, even though I'm not typically too exhausted after the meetings, but that was a long one. And they just heard a lot of different things. And if you have never been through the extraction or been around these situations, I think the misconceptions are easy to have. And the commission members just honestly, they probably have never even seen these or really read the rules a whole lot. So they really don't have a whole lot of like firm, tangible things to work with and make the decisions. So um, I think that you can have type six in different zones, including possibly rural residential, without endangering the lives and, and, uh, or safety of the public. Thank you. Hey guys, don't give me that look, Keith. Come on now. I gave, you, on. I gave you like an 80 day vacation from me or something like that. Uh, Jay Grossman, Chris, hey Fort. I got two parts to do with this. The first being that uh, a facility I've talked about in here before uh, that is one of the biggest distribution, cultivation, manufacturing facilities in the state of California is about 30 minutes south of Salinas. Um, it's in a little town called Greenfield. It's the number one employer in that city. I believe it's the city, but we'll use that loosely. Uh, this facility is sandwiched, and I mean sandwiched, between the city and I knew she hated me. I knew it. <laughs> right? Um, it's sandwiched between the city hall and the police department. And I mean sandwiched like I could take the core of an apple and I could hit a police officer walking out of the front door from their manufacturing facility. Now they just had a catastrophic fire there in their cultivation facility. Um, Manufacturing was safe. There was no huge explosion. There was no nothing like that. And this is literally sandwich. I'm talking fences are touching walls here. Uh, so I would love to see the misconception of, of all this danger. Um, that included my family has a piece of rural residential land, which wouldn't be allowed to do manufacturing in, except that it's 74 acres surrounded by SPI land. So like, don't really, I think there's better odds of a tree falling on me during it you know, logging operation than me actually blowing somebody up. Um, the second part that I think is, is much more overlaying with all of this is that we're making these like not clear cut decisions and these like interpretations that have to come down through the planning department. And the one thing that I am more certain of at this point in my life than anything else is that the planning department has failed abundantly with interpreting, executing, and enforcing those interpretations. It probably is the single most biggest problem with our program. I can feel as they hating me right now. I just don't want to see another ball of this thrown into the system where now it's a whole other set of interpretations, a whole other set of, well, I think this, and we're not, I'm not just saying Leslie, because board, CAO, Leslie, Scott, everybody, Rachel, you know, and it just, it's like playing a game of telephone. <coughs> and we have to eliminate that, or none of this will be successful. And what I see is that the way in these meetings where stuff theoretically, it's like, yeah, this sounds great, this is a great way to work through this, and we can move it this way and that way, it doesn't flush out that way. And we have to, I mean, starting today, we have to stop <coughs> that practice. Thank you. Anybody else? 
Step C in the Trinity County Probation Department effective September 1st, 2018, approximate cost and salary and benefits per month for the deputy officer at um, deputy officer one at A step is $55,737 per year. At step C is $60,102 per year with a difference of $4,365. Yep. Uh, yes, this was a recruitment for a, a deputy probation officer one position that would either serve in the capacity of a school resource officer or backfill a seasoned officer to perform that function. We had uh, five applications received, one immediately screened out of the four remaining applications, uh, very limited uh, history of uh, community corrections work. Uh, there was one candidate on the panel which consisted of two probation management staff, one school district employee, and one county county probation uh, administrator. Uh, the candidate that was chosen is an existing county employee, and uh, we would like to bring this individual into the department at their current pay grade with their other department. Okay, any questions? Is there any questions from the public? All right, with that, come back to the board. So moved. Second. All right, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. All right, so you got to sit and listen to all that fun. There's so much. That was. Okay, transportation. Approve a budget adjustment for 2017 18 in the miscellaneous public works department. Increasing interfund expenses by 29,526 and decreasing services and supplies by 17,179. Approve a budget adjustment for FY 17-18 in the contingency general fund department. Decreasing appropriations for contingency by 12,347. Increase in general funds appropriation of 12,347. Current balance contingency fund is 29,000. Contingent general fund is 29,154 contingent on prior request being approved. Um, 
we do not budget for fires. The hope that we have more fires and we have to subdivide services for. Um, but uh, when we do have a fire, uh, the initial part of the fires usually our fires are usually big enough that they are covered under either an FMAG or uh, which is fire management grant or a CDAA grant. But the problem is those grants pay for overtime and time above what you would have to work. The regular time is paid for by the county. It's essentially, you, they, you go with the assumption you have to be out there and do it. And so um, um, you don't get reimbursed. There are some expenses that happen in the fire that uh, we can't build a road department. If someone's been in a roadblock for a county road, I can cover that. But let's say they're manning it for a non-county road that I cannot cover because uh, then I can only cover expenses that are two county roads. So in some of these disasters, we run into expenses that occur. Um, that we have to reimburse them. For instance, in this fire, we had 29, when all said and done, we had $29,000 in expenses. We were able to use mis, uh, some monies that were involved in miscellaneous public works were things that were identified we just didn't do, such as like the inspection and stuff. And that's something we kind of commonly do when, when we uh, have to go and find money from other sources to offset the cost of the fire. And so we used up all the money that we could, but with the land fire, we still had $12,347 of expenses that could not be offset. And so with that, we're going to make a request for um, uh, uh, reimbursement. And again, um, going back to it, most of the expenses in the land fire were really related to managing the Dur Rock, which was the Disaster Recovery Center that dealt with the uh, bringing in people uh, to um, uh, that dealt with uh, the cow recycle and the removal of debris and everything. And all that time I couldn't build. Again, it's just like closing a private road. I cannot build. So, so that I can answer any questions. Questions. Uh, Sorry. That's okay. Would some of these items uh, possibly have been covered by OES, HHS, from the description? Uh, the way I understand the disaster is the individual department has to cover what is not covered under the right. grants itself. So HHS and OES do not have a budget for DOT people to respond to a disaster. It's both within OK and T budget. I'll buy that one then. So you do so you will start looking at budgeting for some of this? Um, or will this be a continued non-budget? This will be a continued non-budget because, you know, it's, it's for instance, the year before I didn't have anything. I had some expenses in, in uh, the 2015 fires, but they're more related to recovery and training center and then I didn't have any expenses for a couple of years so it, it's a hit and miss every year I, I can tell you right now this year I might have some I will have some expenses related to attending the meetings over in Anderson and things like that um, but they should be fairly minimal um, but again it's what we don't recover through the FA or the CDA grant that we have to find money Okay, Ms. Morris. So I don't think we had an FMAG for the Helena fire, if I remember that correctly. We, we did. did. Yeah. So this is uh, the portion that didn't get covered. Is, did I hear you right? Yes, okay. it's, it's it, FMAG only pays for overtime. Oh, uh, that's right. And so um, these other expenses just don't get covered under either grant. No, it's, mm -hmm. it's the, the problem that we have in the roads department if it, the expectation of the state or agencies above us are that you're going to be working in it anyways, therefore we'll reimburse it. But the problem is, 
is that the road is in a sense an enterprise. So in order to be eligible for reimbursement of road funds, they have to work on road specific items. Right. Oh, I see. I gotcha. All right. Thank you, Rick. And that's that's what kills us. Is I send them the dirt rock, then I'm right. out of that plan. I missed that point. Is there a way to include this in your job description so that we can start to receive some funds or use some of the other grants? Um, or is it included in your job description? You talk about your travel down to Anderson, it won't be covered. Um, Whether it was in my job description or not, it's it, the because your road salary. funds have to be specifically spent to activate your stand that to fund them. But I'm trying to figure out how to get the DOT into OES so we can access those grants or any way to, to access yeah, yeah. them. Think about it. Thank you. Okay. Any public comment? On that, we will come back to the board looking for a motion. So made. Second. Okay. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Same sign. Thanks, Rick. Okay, so we are going to go back to before we go back, people can get it. Okay, addendum uh, approve a budget. Adjustment for FY 2017-18 in the EMS Hospital Department, increasing contributions to other funds by $600. No impact to the general fund. Current cash balance in the EMS Hospital Fund is $4,239. Morning, Chair, or afternoon, Chair. Mike Marks, Office. Uh, this item probably would have been a consent if we had the numbers in time. Okay. But we, uh, the amounts that come in have to be submitted out by law, by code, and we didn't quite have what the numbers are told to make. Okay. And so that's what we're asking for this adjustment for. Okay. Right. Any questions? No, sir. No. Any from the public? Nope. All right. Looking for a motion. You so got one. Most, uh, move to approve out of the controller and then the main. Okay. By signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Same sign. Okay, uh, we are going to have to go back to 5.2. And Finley, I assume you're going to accuse again. I didn't know that, but I sure will. Okay, this is from County Council uh, under the vote of um, Stain. I will read under authority of Government Code Section 25003, providing where the necessary I votes are one short of a majority of the entire board, an abstain vote shall constitute concurrence with the I votes. Each member of the board is thus informed by the rule that he may in such a situation by either an I vote or an abstain vote. Or if he, and sorry. It's okay. I, I, it's, it doesn't bother me more. I can be a he. <laughs> he can't state law. I don't I, know. I don't mind. Okay, all right, all right. So I'll choose. He may vote against the measure by a no vote in any of these events required under Section 25005 that a majority of all members of the board shall concur for passage of the measure as satisfied. Dry Creek Valley Association versus Board Super, uh, Supervisors, 67 Cal, APP 3D 539. Her count votes and says a yes. And she recommends that she should be allowed to change her vote to a no if she cho so chooses. Actually, that's not correct. 
Okay, that's not correct? The second part is not correct. I believe only those that voted in favor have the opportunity to correct a no vote, uh, to correct their vote. Right. It would have to do a reconsider. It would have to be by motion to reconsider. It's not eligible except for the, except for as initiated by somebody who voted in favor. So it would have to be at the pleasure of someone who voted in favor for her modifying. Um, so we would have to, I, you lost me, I'm sorry, I want to get this exactly <laughs> right. I apologize. What? So well, if for a motion to reconsider or a motion to amend, uh, that can only be done by someone who voted in favor of the motion that passed. Okay. So in this case, it would be only one of the three members that voted the actual I can do a motion for reconsideration, and then that, the vote okay. can be taken again. All right, so do any of the members that have voted I would like to reconsider Sure. Okay. So does it have to be seconded, Margaret, or just one person can say yes, reconsider? Well, it has to be seconded. I'm going to ask a question. So what are, what are you asking us to do? Because I'm a little confused myself on this. So um, in other words, you're asking one of us people that voted yes that we want to re-look into this vote, or we just go ahead with our vote and move on and we're done? So I, I, again, I'm not asking you anything. I'm just telling you what the, what the rules say. Uh, the rules say her vote as an abstain constitutes an I, therefore the provision passed. If the board, if at, at the board's pleasure, they would like to modify or change that vote, they have the option of doing a motion to uh, amend, and that needs to be initiated by an individual who voted in favor of it originally. Okay. Okay. I misunderstood as well. So, so you're rescinding? Right. Because I didn't understand. Didn't hear the first part. So I didn't understand. Okay, so we have no motion to reconsider. All right, so then it, it's a done deal. Is that right, Margaret? That's correct. Okay. So it passed. So it passed. Very unusual. Yeah. I don't understand the law at all. Those are so I guess we all learned something today. I just want to be, for the record, it would be a no. And I, I think it's wrong, since all four of us did not know that, that I don't have a, um, an opportunity to say that. So for the record, my vote would be no. I think you're making a mistake. All I want to do is get permission from the Attorney General. So, OK, we're still not close. Yes? No, I, I, I'm just processing that All right, we are going to go to closed session. Um, closed session, government code section 54954.5E, public employee appointment district attorney. Any comment on that? All right, that we're going to go to closed session. <laughs>